Hello folks and welcome to today's live our game show with myself, James Davis and Michael Verney and we're joined by a fairly happy Claire man, Colin Ryan. We're brought to you by OrgoRetro.com. Use the promo code our game to get 15% off. Colin, we'll just go straight to it. Claire are back, aren't they? <laughs> I don't know about that, but it's just, uh, it, it was, it, I suppose, after the disappointment and frustration of last week, um, I actually was 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 only talking to to John during the week, like, and I was kind of like, there, there was there wasn't really a better fixture that they could have had, yeah. um, you know, to redeem themselves after it because if it had been Cork or Waterford, like, there would have been serious serious pressure on them, you know, to get a result and like obviously with Limerick coming down the line, but with Limerick it kind of felt like it was a a bit of a shot to nothing, but at the same time, you, you know, Claire, I, I suppose they feel like they can match up to this Limerick side. Um, you know, uh, and 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 give it to them, I suppose, physically, but also have the legs from. So I think it was it was just a good fixture for them. Uh, I think to focus the mind straight away again after the disappointment of Tipperary last week, because I actually felt they didn't really hurl that badly against Tipperary. But um, obviously, when you give them, you know, a, a nine point lead uh, early in the game, you're you're going to struggle to to get that back in any shape or form, you know. And I think. When they look back in the tip game, it probably wasn't the mistakes. I actually think they'll be most frustrated with the fact that they didn't put pressure on them straight after half time, you know, and and really kick on after gaining the momentum. They kind of, you know, they allowed Tipperary get the puck out and, um, you know, e- easily work the ball up the field. And typical do, tip will cause damage, you know, if you're not if you're not going to do that. And I think that's what probably frustrated them more than the mistakes. Yeah, so it finished like for anyone who was under a rock for the weekend. Limerick two twenty, Clare one twenty four. So. A great one point victory for the banner there. And so Colin John Connellan gave an exhibition. I think he's what 34 now. You were saying you met him during the week. Absolutely brilliant performance at centre back. But he goes back to his brother's wedding then after you know already been there during the day. Surely the bride's going to be fairly put out seeing this lad walking in and he's the talk of the country. Uh no, if you knew if you knew John's family, like, you know, you'd have to accept the fact like that they're hurling mad, you know, like it's not they're they're real genuine people. Um, you know, I've nearly known them all my life. You know, I was in school with John in, in Flannans, like obviously, and you know, he was a year younger than me, but like they're they're just even pa like his brother is hurling mad, like, you know, he looks up to John, you know, he'd have absolutely no problem now with, with John coming in. And John is so unassuming too. You know, like that he'd arrive into that wedding and like he'd probably want to focus to be straight back on. You know, he wouldn't worry about it, you know, or, or, or be gloating or, you know, like he'd, he'd nearly be like want to crawl in under a rock, I'd say, then to talk about it, you know. But he definitely, uh, you know, was in good form, I'd say, going back there, you know, and obviously it probably set the wedding off. Um, you know, I, I, I actually had a different experience in the Munster final last year. We were at a wedding of a friend of mine. Um, and like the whole wedding was held up for the for extra time uh, and everything because they were <laughs> they were too hurling they were too hurling people you know and uh, obviously we had the disappointment then of losing that day so like you know it was a bit a bit different but uh, it brings a different form of excitement and it's a memory I suppose they'll have you know long after um, <laughs> I suppose the things have settled down. <laughs> I was going to say long after the divorce, but I'm only joking. <laughs> I wish them the best. Michael, do you want to jump in there? Yeah, just a word on John Cannon. Jesus Christ, for a lad to have played wing forward, full forward all his life and go back. And he's like, he just was controlling affairs the other night. His positioning is unbelievable. But even just getting in the face of the Limerick lads, like it was an unbelievable performance in him, like even just let, to lead the line the way he did. Yeah, he, he, like, I suppose the the mark of the man was like when when he did his when he did his uh, his bad injury there like uh, a couple of years back like that he went off and did an SNC course you know he's a primary school teacher but like he got qualified in SNC you know while he was doing it like he's just a real driven fella um, but like I think he's he's his game intelligence um, and his his calmness. You know, listen, I'm not I'm not comparing him to, to Declan Hannon quite yet. You know, I think Declan Hannon has been absolutely a phenomenal leader for, for Limerick and has has made that sixth role, you know, great for, for his team. But John kind of has that same calming influence, I think, um, over this Clare team. You know, uh, like I think when you look at, when you missed him in the All-Ireland semi-final last year, I think that's when you realise maybe, you know, what you're missing. Um 
like I would go as far to say is like it will take it will, it will take a lot. We've been struggling to replace him, you know, even in some of the earlier part rounds of the league when he takes a break. You know, we don't have a six like that who's who's a calming influence. And it might be something that, you know, Tony Kelly might finish out his career there, you know, like in that kind of calming role where, you know, you might you might kind of see that. But it, it's, it's a fierce, important role at the minute because there's there's carnage around you, you know, in the back line now at the minute because teams are being dragged everywhere. And to have a six that knows how to play the role, you know, knows when to go, but also, you know, can deliver the ball and talk and communicate around him. Like you look at Tyg de Burka, you know, unfortunate injury last week, and you realise how important he is to the Waterford setup, and they just can't be replaced. Mm, certainly not. Uh, Hurling one two three four says, "Hi guys, interesting stat. Limerick have got seven points and eight points from play in their last two games. They had three from play by half time on Saturday night." Mark Zinch says, "As a Clare man, I'm delighted. However, I still think Limerick will win Munster and the All Ireland." And he also says, "You can see John Conlon's farm in Clonlara from Niall Morans across the Shannon and Castle Connell." Yeah, and you are you still teaching in Limerick, Colin? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So it's nice. So, it's nice to go in tomorrow, now, right? <laughs> what, you what prefer you nearly it? take the bank holiday off to go in today just to get the extra twenty four <laughs> hours of gloating, I'd say. <laughs> uh, no, we're not like that because we. I suppose we haven't won that Ireland yet, but it will be nice. It will be nice. There, they're just you know like. Um, it's been a long time coming, you know, to go in and actually feel like. But I think I think they're a bit rattled. I think they're a small bit rattled after, like you know, the the Waterford game last week. I think they thought like that they'd put it up to Waterford, and obviously, you know. So I think they're a bit worried that you know they've the hotels booked for 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 <laughs> for for July, you know, and August. They'll be looking for uh, looking to see what the cancellation policy is on that. You know, they're not quite there yet, but they're definitely you know a small bit rattled. Wasn't it uh, Jurgen Klopp who said after the Champions League final last year, book your hotels for the Champions League final next year? And of course, there he is. Uh, Michael Burney was wondering, could we shoehorn in Jurgen Klopp doing his hamstring yesterday when he was we celebrating? Did it. We just We've did it, it. First. <laughs> yeah. Um, what else was it? I was, there was something in particular I was going to say there to you, Colin. Um, is it Palace Kennery that? So basically, it's uh, Kyle Hayes's parish that you're teaching in, is it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Kyle though didn't go to school with us, but yeah, it's the same parish. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that that place has had a big surge in terms of their hurling the last few years, hasn't it? Yeah, Kildare Palace Kenry is like they've done phenomenal work at underage. You know, we've been we've been lucky, I suppose. We we um we don't really like our our stronghold is Kildare Palace Kenry. We get some from Belly Brown, but I suppose the the real hurlers that uh, coming in first year would probably hit into hard skull. Um, so like we're we're very lucky that they're doing some phenomenal work in Kalama Palace Kenry. So we're getting the we're reaping the benefits outside in school. You know, we we were in the Munster C. Uh, final this year under 19 um, like we lost by a point you know unfortunately in the in the Munster final but just it's nice to have a bit of success at school level uh, David Fitzgerald there who's playing wing back for the Limerick 20s is inside with us you know so it's nice to kind of have a little um, I, sp- I suppose a bit of a bit of inter-county experience around it we've, we've a good few footballers as well you know with a couple of lads on the Limerick 20 footballers we've the goalie for the Limerick minor hurlers um you know, a couple of lads on the panel and the Limerick minor footballers. So, like, you know, it's all down to the work that they're doing in Kildare Palace Henry. You know, they're really getting a foothold, and obviously, they're a senior hurling and a senior football club now at the minute. So, mm. you know, for quite a for quite a small place, you know, it's they're they're having a lot of success and they're you know really driven and there's a great group of lads coming through there. Michael, did you ever think that Shane O'Donnell would become a battering ram, ball winning half forward? It's unbelievable. No, I didn't. And I kind of, kind of gotten the, the talk was that, you know, he was going to be back for last year's championship and he was after bulking up significantly. And he's just, he's so dangerous out around there. And he was, I suppose maybe there was, a, there was a fair element of freedom as well because he was playing that kind of tankless inside role for so long. Um, It's just amazing, Shano, when you think about it. Like, he didn't play a league this year. He didn't play a league last year. You know, TJ Reid didn't play a league this year. Stephen Cluxton didn't play anything and was retired. All these guys that haven't played league and are all of a sudden having such a big play uh, in the championship, it's its bonkers, really. I wouldn't, you wouldn't have predicted a lot of it, anyway. Yeah, Colin, will you talk to us about the first time you had Shane O'Donnell on the panel? Obviously, we all know what he did with the hat-trick, but, like, the player then versus the player now. Yeah, and I think, like, I think you mentioned it there, though, like, you know, he's bulked up something unreal. You know, when Shane came on the scene... Like he was, he was a real athletic. He was agile, but but he was quite slender, you know. Like he was, he was that kind of rangy, arms and legs everywhere. But like he knew he was in control of them, you know. <laughs> but but like you know, we didn't kind of know what was going to happen next, you know. He was he he was phenomenal. But like I think what what 
what people are starting to see now and we saw from a very early age like is his ball winning ability you know like he can go up in the middle of a, a big group and just like hurry up and, and flick it down but but also when it goes to ground he seems to have this ability that I can only remember Dan Shanahan having where like you know he can get his hand on a ball like real low down you know if it drops and bounces like he just he just seems to be able to just get his hand on it um, quicker than most people and once he has the ball in his hand then his intelligence is just phenomenal I actually think it's because of that then that he's able to bring in the likes of, you know, David Fitz and Tony around him. You know, he's a dream to play with. I've said this numerous times because Shane doesn't think about, you know, headlines or scores or, you know, he just seems to make the right decision all the time. But that springs, I suppose, from his his intelligence, I suppose, off the field as well as on the field. You know, he's a, he's a real bright guy. And um, it, it, for the young lads to see Shane O'Donnell and have him around is is absolutely brilliant. You know, I, I think if he arrived on the first day before the Munster Championship, I'd start him. You know, I don't think it would make a difference what he's done because he looks after himself so well. Um, and he just seems to have that ability to, to just switch it on when he needs to. He doesn't need, you know, a phenomenal amount of game time to get him up to speed again, especially maybe when he hasn't been injured and stuff like that and he's looking after himself. But you know what you do, Shane? He went to Harvard. He went to Harvard in... 2019 came back and was man of the match in the first round against against Waterford down in Walsh Park. He was unbelievable the other night. He was probably quite, he was quiet by his standards. Maybe the first day out against Tip uh, last year, he was his best championship ever, having not played league. Like that's freaky kind of territory. Like that's a bit of a freak of a player that can actually go and do that type of thing. Yeah, I remember interviewing him several years ago and asking him what he was into outside of hurling. And he's he's kind of he said this video game called Dota, which I've never <laughs> played. Don't know what it's about, but anyway, I'd say he's he's a sort of a cool enough type of dude. But Colin, do you reckon from a Limerick point of view, it's kind of worrying that we were told, you know, they've kind of been doing a load of work behind the scenes, uh, you know, big preseason block, all this kind of stuff. Won the league anyway. When their first game, Declan Hannan's off injured after thirteen minutes. Apparently, it's a groin. And yet he plays a full match a week later and he seems okay. And then Sean Finn and Keen Lynch are injured during this game as well. So, like, have they, have they timed this right? Is the is the four games going to catch out anybody? Mm-hmm. Like, where do you think Limerick are at? Because they weren't exactly brilliant against Lim- or Watford last week. No, and I like um I suppose it's you're trying to manage how the how the season works out. I, I suppose John would have like when they really looked at last year's season, they felt like they were undercooked a small bit in the Munster Championship and were probably lucky to kind of get through, you know, an odd game and an odd mistake. But they built their way up obviously to an odd Ireland semi final and Gerard Hegarty was like, you know, he just seemed to come on as the year went on. You know, and they kind of got better and stuff like that. But I think what what you don't realise though is the the amount of miles like on the clock for these lads. Like you know that they have been going non-stop now. You know, and and through their own success, you know they've just they've and every team wants to take them down and physically wants to go at them. And they seem to have married, I suppose, the the idea of being physical but also being fit. You know, and being able to get around the pitch and stuff like that. But sometimes when like other teams are trying to take a team like Limerick down no more than, you know, trying to take Kilkenny down. And I suppose that's, you know, where, but Kilkenny played a very different game. You know, Kilkenny was, you know, man, man on man, you know, you stayed in your position, you, you won your ball, you know, and then you moved. But the amount of miles that these Limerick lads are covering, you know, the last couple of years and the way they play, um, you, like they're going to have to get an injection of somebody to come in. And obviously Carl O'Neill has come in, but like they've tried a lot of lads this year, but the team that was named for the first round of the Munster Championship was the very same team that nearly won their All-Ireland, you know, five years ago. So like it is, it, they're trying to find new blood, but this is a generational type of a group that just, you know, have come along together and they've been so good that it's very hard to replace them. But it is going to catch up with some of them, at, you know, I, I suppose I won't say sooner rather than later, but at some point it is going to catch up with them, and it's going to be up to some team to have the hunger and the willingness to go at them. I suppose to 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 really, you know, to to influence that and and to get a result out of a game. But it like it is unusual to see that amount of injuries, like especially Keane Lynch, for instance, like who's yeah. had a couple of them now the last couple of years, um, and you can see that he's bulked up a lot. But I wonder has that you know, sacrificed maybe his agility and his ability to move around the place because he's a different player to what he was, you know, three or four years ago, like when he was midfield and he was going everywhere and he was very mobile. He's gone very, very, you know, he's bulked up a lot, you know, uh, physically wise, but it's hard to know whether that's going to, you know, or that has made an influence on on his body then. 
Yeah, Michael, like, this is the first time that Limerick have been beaten in the Championship since um, 2019 and the first home defeat since early, earlier in that season against Cork. So, like, I don't know, where, are Limerick in any way in trouble here or are we still expecting them to waltz out of the group? No, it definitely won't be waltzing out of the group anyway. Uh, and they're definitely in a bit of trouble. Like, if you look at that, that game in 2019 against Cork, Cork came down to, to the Gaelic grounds having been beaten by, I think, were they beaten by Tip the week before, I think. Um, Limerick were put on the back foot straight away. They reacted quite well. Still lost the tip with that last group game. You can say it didn't mean anything. Then they produced an unbelievable performance in the All Ireland semi final, in the All in the Munster final. And you think they're going to waltz the All Ireland and Kilkenny caught them in the semi final. So when they've been beaten, there's usually been signs there that they're going to be beaten. So this is, there's no point in saying any different. It's two bad performances in a row. They haven't, you know, clocked the type of, you know, digits they'd like, usually up around the 30 mark. What were they? It was uh, 22, was it? No, 21, 21 the first week. It was uh, 221 the other day, which is a good but higher, but they still left, I think they left 14 wides behind them. Um, well, I'll just say as well, most Tipperary people must have got a good kick out of somebody playing against Limerick and actually playing for two halves. Um, you know, it's been a while, like you're used to kind of, a t you know, yourselves, you throw it down for maybe 35, 40 minutes, but it was refreshing to see a team actually go at them for two halves uh, the, the, the other night. <laughs> go on, you surely want to come in. Well, I mean, it's true. Tipperary have faded big time in those matches. Like, Colin, the big talk in the last few years has been this third quarter from Limerick and can teams sort of survive with them? Tipperary, perfect example of a team that can't. But this was two weeks in a row that that expected Limerick burst just did not happen. So, like, have teams worked them out or is it an energy thing? Uh, there's a bit of both, I think. You know, I, I think what, what teams have realised, though, is that you you can't give Limerick, uh, you know, an easy ball and let them work the ball out the field. You know, I think Clare are really good at going man for man. I think they're back. And now we've been blessed, I suppose, with the... You know, Adam Hogan coming along this year, you know, who's a real teak tough, you know, man marker as a cornerback. And obviously having Rory Hayes, who has legs on him as well. You know, like it, it is down to, you know, your ability to to be able to match up against these players. You know, like and then having Dermot Ryan and, uh, and Dave McInerney, I suppose, at half back who are able to follow players up the field. And you could see a marked difference there the other day, like that Carl O'Neill came short for a puck out. And David McInerney was right up behind him, you know, like that there, there wasn't that even level of like, you know, we're going to let Limerick win the ball in their own half and let them move up along the field. I think, you know, Joe Canning had it right um, there recently when he said like that the only way you're going to beat this Limerick team is to get fit enough to go man for man with them, you know, and 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 to be able to, to you can't give them a plus one. You can't give Limerick this Limerick team a plus one and especially now you know, when they're a bit off, uh, you know, if you give them a plus one, you're giving them an out, you know, and I suppose the big difference between Waterford and Clare was possibly, you know, their efficiency in front of goal. Um, you know, I think Waterford had been a bit more efficient in front of goal, you know, um, they had a lot of bad wides uh, the first day and and possibly a belief thing with Waterford, you know, I think maybe, you know, that they didn't really have the belief that they could have gone and, 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 and won that game, you know, because they've had a lot of scaring in recent years, I suppose, in the Munster Championship, whereas Clare are coming off, you know, knowing that they can match up against Limerick and they kind of felt like, you know, they had the hurt of the week before and everything else and they had the legs in them. But still, like, you, it's a sign of a great team, Limerick, you know, that even after it all, you know, Clare still only win by a point, you know. So, like, it's going to be up to Tip and Cork. Like, the way I look at it is you can't give Limerick chances. You can't give them, like, they're like a cat with nine lives. You know, they just come good around All-Ireland time. Like, I would say it's up to Tip and Cork now to, you know, to knock them out. You know, because I think now is the time to get them. You know, when they're vulnerable and when, you know, you, you don't want them getting out of Munster and getting into, like, you know, the perfect scenario for Limerick might be, you know, coming third in Munster, you know, and, and, and going on that route where you kind of build up another couple of games and... and you know, win them handily, get to an All Ireland semi final, and, and and suddenly they're kicking into gear. You know, so like now is the time, you know, to, for for Tip and Cork to go at them. And I think, you know, Tip will look at it as a great opportunity, like to test where they're at, I suppose. And Liam Cattle will, I think, cherish that. I think, you know, to go up against them and to to have a cut at them. Mm, and I'd say Brian Lohan will cherish the uh, opportunity to knock Davy Fitz completely out of the championship. But we'll come to that later on. Obviously, Watford struggling at the moment. Ryan Loftus says Ryan Taylor still very underrated when he plays well. Clare go well. Like, he's unreal. I think he should have been an all-star last year. 
Detox 101. I see all the Clare fellas celebrating outside on the field. You'd swear they won the All-Ireland and the Tidy Towns and the set dance. And fair play to them, but they have Davy and Liam Cahill to come next. Derek Lynch of Clare FM says, Good morning, gents. What a great bank holiday Monday. Uh, Monday morning. <laughs> Hope you're well, Shane. Just there wasn't quite as much out of him when I was down at Cusick Park last week. <laughs> he was saying hello to me on the way in. I didn't see him on the way out. But, um, it's a bad job when Tip. It's a bad job when Tip aren't playing, and you still get a cut, Shane. Like you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Bad Colin, job or a good job? <laughs> yeah. And um, Colin, do you, like, do you feel like last year the cobwebs of well, whatever you want to say about the Kilkenny performance, and now even the Tipperary performance, conceding five goals was fairly bad now. But do you think that it's all kind of full steam ahead now for for Clare that you feel like the All Ireland tilt is back on the menu here? Yeah, I, I like listen. It, it'll be as, as far removed now for Brian Lowen's head winning All Ireland now as like you know the, they're going to be concentrating on uh, you know obviously Waterford next and like there's a massive opportunity there like you know you're looking at four points will probably it'll be scoring difference four points you know one team is going to get knocked out but like Clare are going to be looking at that and going like you know if we can get to six and, and get two wins but Cork were flying last night you know like and you don't want to be going into the last round. You know, having to be Cork, I suppose the plus that you're in Cusick Park, but you know, you 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 want to beat Waterford. You just don't know how Waterford are going to react. I suppose after their two losses, um, Davy will have them up for it, I'm sure. But Clare will be just looking at that Waterford game and trying to get a performance, and maybe you know, feeding into the doubts maybe that Waterford would have getting on top of them. You know, getting a result there, no matter what happens, getting a result there, get onto four points, but. Like you were just saying there about Ryan Taylor, like, like what, like what a player, like you know, I I felt that um, when Davy Fitz was missing against Tipperary, we were short on that one player who, like, we need we're we're full of energy. Like what Claire have been really good at in recent years is when we've played our best hurling is when Ryan Taylor, David Fitz, Tony Kelly, Colin Malone are all coming back into our half back line and carrying ball you know, and carrying ball out the field, you know, at, at pace. And when you're short an option on that, and I thought when we were short David Fitzgerald, um, you know, against Tipperary, we were short a man to be able to do that because that is a real high energy game. You know, like that if if Ryan Taylor needs a break, David Fitz does it. You know, if David Fitz needs a break, then Colin Malone goes back and does it. You know, like you, you need bodies there to be able to do that constantly. And it also, what, what people didn't realise is it allowed then like Peter Duggan to be able to position on the edge of the square and like, Peter obviously like you know arms and legs he's like Spider Man you know for the second for the second goal you know like Peter's just a nuisance but and I think he'd be the first to say like that maybe um, you know out around the middle of the pitch where the, the pace of the game is is got an awful lot quicker now he, he possibly struggles but having him on the edge of the square there you know and causing absolute carnage you know and and like the first goal the, like the first chance he had you know came out of nothing as well and obviously Nicky Quaid had a great save you know tipping it over the bar. Um, but, but like the addition of Aidan McCarthy and Mark Rogers and all these players, like like you know, we've we've been very fortunate in recent years that we just have developed a, a group of players that are very very athletic, they're very uh, bright, uh, you know, intelligent fellas, but great runners with the ball, and they're very unassuming, you know, like Ryan Taylor and David Fitz. You know, like they they'd be the first to tell you, you know, that they probably struggled at underage. You know, neither of them were superstars. Davy obviously had his struggles coming through and making the breakthrough in the senior team. But like, you know, I've often said this before that lads sometimes only come into their prime at twenty five. You know, when they realise that they're physically and uh, mentally ready to 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 maybe take it on at inter county level. And these lads are playing phenomenal stuff. Like, and Ryan Taylor has been. Like arguably probably the best hurler in in the Munster Championship so far because like he's he's laid, the amount of balls he's got on even against Tipperary, you know he I think I just I just remember him winning three frees in a row in the second half running down the sideline when Clare were under pressure and being take being cleaned out of it you know so he's got stronger too to be able to take them challenges and that little one where like he's going to get killed one of the days if he flicks the ball over somebody's head you know going at hundred miles an hour I just worry that somebody's going to come and clean him out. I love yeah, the celebration I, after when he won the free at the very end as well. You could just see what it meant. And the energy, though, and mobility that you have, a, it's like a, 
he have a mobility and a robustness to you, Colin, that makes you so like you match up perfect to Limerick in that sense. But then you have your Dave Fitzgeralds and these boys that are able to punish Tony Kelly's able to punish from distance as well. And like Duggan had no right to even get a shot away for that. He had no right to get the ball even for that for that goal chance. Now Nicky Quaid will definitely be disappointed with some of the say, like some of the saves he pulled off earlier in the night were outrageous. But that was probably one that got away from him. And uh, there was a fair press on his puck out as well. He refused to allow them to build from the puck out, would be fair to say, the whole night. Yeah, well, like, when you've, when you've players like Barry Nash, you know, like, you, you can't give Barry Nash a puck out. Like, like it, it has been seen that, you know, they have no problem working the ball through the lines, um, you know, and stuff like that. Like, and, and I, again, I suppose we, we can match up, you know, Dermot Ryan and Dave McInerney, you know, they want ball down on top of them. You know, they want, you know, like... And you could see that they were they were a step outside John. They were able to to kind of read the play, you know, and not leave the spaces there. But you can really only do that when you have the athleticism to maybe cover or match up against them. But like from looking at like Claire, you're just saying there, Michael, that Claire match up really well against Limerick. But like my worry then is against Cork when the game yeah. just opens up completely where we'd be, you know, and you see like the game, the game, like the Cork and Waterford game was like a completely different like sport nearly yeah. you know in a sense yeah. because like the, the you know the spaces and the openness in it like from from just watching it was was just crazy you know like there was car clads with 35 yards of space you know with nobody around him and that could have come down to maybe the confusion of not having tied the burka there you know and i know they mentioned the sunday game last night about like how you know, Jack Fagan doesn't really know how to play that role as well as Tyg de Burke probably sitting a bit deeper um, and, and the lack of communication. But Cork can do that to you. They can stretch you, you know, and and and, and really have you at sixes and sevens. And um, like, and that's where, like, that'll be a test of a clear team, you know, how, how they cope with something like that and how they turn that into, because physically they can match. There's probably two teams in the country that can match with Limerick and that's probably Kilkenny and Clare at the minute. You know, in terms of their robustness and physicality, and you know, Tip will probably get there. I, I just think it's probably a year early. I think for maybe Liam Cal's project, you know, he's trying to go down that route um, of developing that you know type of a team that will come at you. But then Cork in a one-off game can absolutely rip you apart. You know, if they if they get on a roll. But I suppose Cork's consistency is their big problem at the minute that they need to to get on top of. Just that's a fascinating thing as well. It's just how different teams play. The Clare match up so well with Limerick. Cork play a completely different style. And you're just thinking, you know, potentially for Cork, if someone else takes out Limerick, you know, could Cork win all Ireland? But can they actually go and beat Limerick is another story. I think we were chatting about with Shano the other day on the show as well about like how do Cork prepare for Limerick when they don't, you know, they, have a, they play a completely different style. They have completely different players. They don't have those physical kind of players. And I just think... There's a, there's a couple of nice different styles in the championship at the moment, and I think a lot of different teams. A lot some teams can't beat Limerick, but they can beat all the other teams if you get me as well. I think that's fascinating for the for the coming months. Yeah, there's a couple of other points to to bring up from the game the other day. Aver Quilligan coming in and going into the goal that was a big call to drop him and Foodie, who'd obviously look a mistake. I mean, I'd I'd only fully blame him for the second goal that Jake when Jake Morris robbed him. The sideline one a little bit unfortunate. After that. I think John Conlon should have controlled the ball that went out for the other goal. But anyway, he dropped him, even though his puck outs were great. Quilligan came in, did pretty well. Another point I'd make is, again, the half-back line were cleared. Like, Dermot Ryan and David Beckett are only taking on shots too often, I would feel, again, when they could pop the ball to all the talent they have in front of them. And Dermot Ryan had three fouls and converted scores, or maybe even four, you know, so just probably... I know there's one thing where you're trying to go balls to the wall to get the ball, but there's discipline as well at the far side. And then finally, the free taking with Limerick. This seems to be coming, becoming an issue now, Colin. Obviously, you took them for years. Is, is it becoming a bit of an issue for them? I, like, I wouldn't have thought so. Like, you know, you look at Aaron Galan and you think, like, the, you know, he's probably one of the best free takers in the last number of years. Uh, like, are the distractions of what's happening, you know, like, is he a bit off? It's it's very hard to know. Like in terms of, you can only imagine that he's putting in the same practice that he has done, you know, throughout the years. Like, and you can sometimes it comes down to a confidence team when the, maybe the team isn't going that well, and the pressure of a free is more. You know that like you're in tighter games, and you know they've um, uh, maybe come under a small bit more pressure, and the team isn't as confident. Maybe you know, but like doesn't seem to be affecting Dermot Burns anyway. <laughs> 
<laughs> that much he's like he's a machine in terms of like you know hitting freeze and stuff like that but it probably is just something to stemming from maybe Limerick not being at full tilt a confidence thing you know Aaron himself probably isn't you know hurling as free flowing as you know what he has been in in recent years you know Seamus Flanagan seems to be the the one who's carrying that forward line a small bit you know even Peter Casey isn't probably playing as well as now I know he had a great game against Waterford I suppose but like you know, Adam Hogan did a great job on him. I thought the other night, you know, you have to follow him. You know, he's that type of uh, a player that'll sneak into gaps and holes and, and watch the, the, the game play out and, and link a lot of play. So it takes a lot of, I suppose, uh, unselfishness to be able to mark somebody like that, you know, because you have to be nearly not concentrating on the ball. You know, you have to nearly go like, I'm not, I'm not going to hit it, you know, and be happy with that and accept it, you know, that I'm going to stay out here and mark him. It's a, it's a small bit like Mark and Tony Kelly, you know, like Cahal Barrett, the last day, you, you nearly need to say like, I'm happy to not hit the ball because he's, you know, he's going to drift in around because the minute you go for a ball, Peter Casey or a Tony Kelly type of player will, will see that and will drift somewhere else, you know, and, and be able to get on. But you say there about matching up against teams like, but like, Tony seems to do really well against Limerick because, again, they don't pick him up, you know, as a man marker, you know, and I know he carried in an ankle injury to the, to the tip game, you know, he was unfortunate, I suppose, Tony's ankles have been, you know, his ankle injury has been probably a big uh, hindrance to him in the last number of years. And like to know what he's putting his body through to tug out for Clare, you know, like he's the type of person that probably needs a complete rest, probably surgery on that ankle. But I, he's worried, I'd say, that if he does get it, that, you know, it could be out for a long period of time. Like, so I think people sometimes underestimate how much these lads put their body through, you know, to, to get out in a, a clear jersey, you know, and Tony, it means an awful lot to him. But then when lads think he's a bad game, you know, they don't realise what, what he's actually going through or, you know, stuff like that. So you could see that he, that was obviously released an awful lot more against Limerick and he was more mobile and he was moving around the place a lot better. And you could see he was even confident in his own movement himself. Yeah, giving Carl Barrett no credit is what I'm hearing here. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Listen, I've I've been around Carl Barrett long enough now. I'll tell you to to, to know that he's an absolute nuisance. So <laughs> it's uh well, it's hard to mark. So like moving forward for Limerick, like not starting Groad Hegarty. And obviously, Carl uh, Carl O'Neill is an excellent player and all that kind of stuff. But like I found that interesting that they didn't start a guy who has delivered for them so often over the years. And I don't know. Maybe Kylie's trying to send out a message. What did you make of that? I, I thought that was unusual too, you know, Giroud has been their go-to kind of, you know, leader, I suppose, really when in their in their forward line when things have been bad. But um, yeah, like maybe he was just, like you see, I suppose, where do you get that competitive edge in your panel? You know, if you're not going to, like they've given all these lads a chance uh, in the league and then suddenly they don't play them in the first round of the Munster Championship. And then if they go poorly and you don't play them again in the second round of the Munster Championship, does that mean that these lads are just going to ease off, you know, and, and kind of not be competitive in training uh, and not be given, you know, everything, you know, and, and we've, I've been there in panels before, you know, where lads know they're going to be subs, they know they're not going to get game time and suddenly, you know, it drops off and training then really suffers. So like, I think it might've been, you know, a point to prove maybe with management that, you know, we need to give somebody a run here and show that there is a, you know, something's going to happen if you don't play badly. But it's it's hard to know whether it was a a, a kind of a, a mark on Groot Hegarty in terms of like what he did to get sent off the previous week. You know, I thought that was a very, very foolish yellow card. You know, I actually thought it could have been a straight red. I thought it was worse than, than Seamus Flanagan's. You know, I thought he completely sideswiped the, the Watford player when the ball was you know, well gone. And I think he'd have been well within his rights to give him a red card. And I suppose it has happened maybe once too many times, maybe for John Kiley's liking that um, he's put them in that position. And when they're vulnerable like that, you, you know, they can't go down to 14. And maybe he was a small bit worried about that. But it, 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 it doesn't kind of, I suppose, listen, you're looking for every kind of help in Limerick to see that things aren't going well, but it doesn't read well for them. You know, if you're being honest, you know, it kind of, it reads that they've been perfection, you know, like the last four or five years, everything is, you know, every decision they've made has gone well. So it's it's hard to know what's what what's there at the minute and, you know, how they're going to react to it. Yeah, just uh, I'll throw it over to you, Michael, but uh, David Byrne says on Twitter, tip Limerick in a few weeks' time now is going to be absolutely massive. Not good for Limerick that Cork clocked up a big points difference against Watford yesterday. Could easily come down to score difference at the end of the round, Robin. And uh, just another thing before I throw it to you, Michael, is Davy Fitz matching up with Kyle Hayes. 
like it's it's great that Claire have an absolute giant to match up with him, and Hayes was still very good. But you know, you need to pick out a couple of those athletes and say, right, they're not going to destroy us. But uh, go ahead, Michael. Yeah, no, did they, I, just on John Kylie, I actually think Kylie was right to leave Hegarty off, um, because I think what he did against uh, what he did against Walford nearly made him a bit of a liability and a bit of a liability to himself and to his team, and even the way he was remonstrating as he was coming off, and he was trying to explain to Kylie what was after happening, just not really the the Limerick way. Um, he mightn't have got the reaction. I, I, I thought he'd get a massive reaction from Hegarty when he came on and came into the game on Saturday. Uh, he didn't really, but as you said there, Colin, I do, like we're saying Limerick haven't changed their starting 15 really since 2018. You know, they mixed it up the other night. They left a hurler the year on the bench, gave and gave kind of gave Cotton O'Neill a chance. Maybe didn't get the bounce that they probably thought they would have out of it, but uh, fascinating to see how they manage that three weeks now. Are they able to get Finn and Lynch back in the field? I think Lynch, uh, I don't think it was a bad hamstring tear like he did against Waterford last year, but he still probably popped it or felt it tighten in a small bit. He'll probably be under pressure. Sean Finn will probably be under pressure too. I think it was his, his knee. Uh, and all of a sudden, uh, all of a sudden, we're going to have to see all these guys that were saying, yeah, they have a great squad. They go into the squad. But guys that were coming on for 10 or 15 minutes are going to have to start games now. Uh, and then other guys are going to have to go deeper into their squad to finish it out. Now, they do have Shane O'Brien back available. And Adam English should be back available. They were both with the 20s. But there's question marks around Limerick now. And that's like that's what we want. We were going into the Munster Championship, lads, in the All-Ireland, thinking that, like John Milan said a couple of weeks ago, that you might as well just hand Limerick the title. Like, and that's what people were thinking. And it's like it's far from that now at the moment. And that's what we want. Well, we yeah, but uh, going, going, back, going back to that, though, you're talking like, I always say like that this Limerick team is a real generational group of players that came through together. You know, they were they were they were beneficiaries of the changing of the academy in Limerick, you know, and how they professionalism and the way they coached and how they set up and stuff like that. But the difference between this Limerick team and the Kilkenny team who, you know, won so many down through the years was Brian Cody, like they had players coming every year. You know, there was nearly a new player that could have been an all star, you know, in that Kilkenny team every year. You know, they were just really good at introducing you know, a, a bolter or two bolters every year. It was never the same team. Whereas my only concern with this Limerick team is it has been, you know, the same players that have won them the All-Ireland the first time and they're still counting on them. And like, they just don't have the replacements there because these lads were so powerful. Like, you're never going to get an athlete like Garot Hegarty again. You know, like, and you know, it's 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 going to be a long time before he does. Um, Kane Lynch, an absolute magician, but injuries are, you know, causing a bit of a bit of a problem for him, you know, the last couple of years. Um, like these lads have been through the ringer, but they don't have the replacements coming through behind them that are, you know, pushing them on. And that's the big difference between this Limerick team and, and the Kilkenny team, you know, that, that that were so successful at and that's how it really is hard to win so many of these. You know, Limerick are really making hay for what they have. You know, they're they're like you have to commend them for that. That like when they have this generational group of players, they're winning as much as they can. But I don't think the conveyor belt is there the same way that maybe the traditional Kikenny was, you know, or Tipperary, for instance, did they have the flow of players that are coming through after it? Yeah, just Tip never did back to back, of course, before Verney uh, brings it in there. Wasn't well, actually it. going to, but you're in that sort of situation where you know we're going to hop all over you. It's paradise. Get in first. It's get, in first. <laughs> get in first. Yeah. <laughs> In the other game then, Cork beat Watford 27 points to 18 and just looking at the, the players who did the score, uh, Rob Downey, who's brilliant at the back, he got a couple of points, Dara Fitzgibbon, he got four, uh, Patrick Horgan got eight, two of those from play, James Harney got three and Robbie O'Flynn coming off the bench and scoring two, great after the fact that he'd you know, done his ankle so badly not so long ago in the league. On the other side, Watford starting forwards got just one point from play, Neil Montgomery. And, you know, when was it in the first half that they got their first score from play? It was something like, it was 28 minutes, Desi Hutchinson. Like, this was a fairly desperate performance from Waterford, uh, Colin, but I suppose you have to give Cork all the credit too. Yeah, Cork were hopping. It's uh, like, it's hard to know how much the Waterford game took out of, or the, the Limerick game took out of Waterford. You know, I think um, uh, they would have had a big regret, I'd say, Waterford, that, you know, i don't think they thought they would be as close to Limerick as what they eventually ended up being, you know, and I think they probably regret maybe not, you know, getting that over the line when they had a chance. And sometimes that can suck the life out of, you know, training for the week, 
you know, that you realise you had a chance, you, you, you didn't take it. And suddenly then you have a fresh Cork team coming at you, uh, you know, and, and Cork and Waterford, I suppose, listen, Cork would match up with Waterford quite well. Waterford would not be consider themselves a physical team. They'd consider themselves being a running team. You know, I suppose like Cork, they want to keep the spaces open and, um, you know, run into them spaces. They don't want the game to turn into, uh, you know, a battle in the middle third, neither team. So like, you know, when you have that energy and freshness that Cork had coming in, it was probably the perfect um, storm really, I think for, you know, how the game went and like, you know, as I said there a while ago, it was like watching two different sports. You know, it was just so, it was like, it was it was just over and back. It was just scores coming from everywhere. There was nobody tight. You know, there was nobody laying a glove on anybody. Um, it was just a, a meek Munster Championship game. And I think like, you know, I see somebody say like this, you know, we do get bad games. You know, I thought that was a, a, a terrible spectacle really, you know, in terms of, of Munster Championship hurling, you know, you kind of want that bit of a cut and a bit of an edge to it, and the game just played out. I think uh, it was nearly over after after thirty minutes, really. Yeah, I thought it was an awful game. I have to be honest. The talk to Kenny Galway was far better, although some people would have criticised that game for nearly being too open. But um, like at the at the flip side of this, Cork coughed up five goal chances, and like I was watching the game with the father yesterday, and he was saying, "Geez, Tipperary be under pressure against this Cork team," and I said. I mean, true because of all the pace and all that. But at the flip side, Tipperary aren't going to miss five goal chances. So there was there was those chances. Plus also, I felt, Michael, that Jack Prendergast was taken out with a foot trip inside the D yeah. in the first half. With he didn't get a free. Year. He did not get a free, lads. Oh, Kieran my God. Kieran Joyce completely took him out. I mean, Kieran yeah. Joyce did the right thing. like, but Yeah, he was... Black, he was Black, Black card's only for Clare, lads, Shane. Yeah. yeah. Against Tipperary. <laughs> against Tipperary. So we're okay for the rest of the year. We're okay for the rest of the year now. I think we're clear. I think that rule only applies to Clare v Tip. It's just like, you know, I don't know what it is. Yeah. That <laughs> was, uh, yeah, you're dead right. So, so every chance you get, Colin, definitely. Um, but, like, at that moment in time, you could say there was another man travelling back, but he was the last man back. That was a, that's potentially uh, a penalty, and it's potentially a guy in the sim bin for 10 minutes. So that was a bit of a game changer. It said, like, baffling, baffling how he didn't get a free. It was also... Um, it was baffling from a Waterford point of view the way they were playing at times. I, I couldn't believe even how naive they were at times and how open. How I couldn't believe the spaces that were that they were leaving. Um, it was bizarre. Even on their own puckouts, playing against uh, kind of a bit of a breeze. They had three men inside. The ball wasn't reaching the three lads inside. It was just there was a lot of kind of strange things going on. And Waterford's, you know abysmal record in the round robin goes on. They've one win in fourteen games. They've picked up three. Uh, points from a possible 28 and like just to talk about the general kind of malaise in Waterford at the moment they've played 15 games in championship at senior uh, under 20 minor across both codes and they haven't won one of them um, and it's not going to get much easier for the senior hurlers from here on in the minors and the under 20 uh, hurlers are already out of the championship and it's not going to get any easier from here on in but that was yeah that was just a really disappointing Waterford performance I think we kind of flagged it Shane on the show on Thursday, how much of a physical effort would it actually take out of uh, Waterford to let, throw it down to throw it down to Limerick, not get result, lose new ties, new uh, or lose tight to Burke and try and get going again a week later, and it just it never happened. Waterford looked leggy at all from the start. Caleb Lyons tried to get moving at different times, even in the game. And you just think this isn't a lad that's moving as free as he was even the week before. They just didn't. Uh, they didn't look to be moving. And just a quick one as well. Did you see? I put the video up on Twitter. I couldn't believe this. The lads, things have changed a lot. Did you see when Mikey Kiley went down? And he has he has a white ankle sock and he is at the top half of the Watford sock cut off and just hanging on top of his ankle. He was just it was like it looked like a bandage around his leg. And he this pulled common, it down then. Ah, oh, this this is mad lads. Very, oh. It's very it's very common in uh in soccer. Like I was obviously playing and, and just to get it in there, our own club Newmarket Celtic won the FAI Junior Cup. Uh, so I actually, I actually missed, uh, I actually missed the Clare Limerick game. Uh, I didn't, I didn't get into it live because the market Celtic were playing. So great for our local club that uh, they took down another tip team, St Michael's, which was, uh, which is a nice Clare v tip, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, kind of conundrum there. But like, listen, uh, Clare club has never won the FAI Junior Cup. And uh, the market have never won it, obviously. So, like, you know, it's just something that is really good for our community. But it's it stems from a soccer thing. I see all the soccer lads, you know, they wear a sock and then, like, the long sock. I think it's just the quality, maybe, of the foot or the sole in the hurling socks, possibly, that isn't the same, maybe, as the, the sports socks, maybe, that are out there now. But especially when they're doing a lot of running. Yeah, <laughs> you know, true enough, yeah. 
Were, were you playing the soccer the other night? I know you no, have been playing. No, 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 I'm finished. I'm finished. Just, just hurling. Just hurling. It's hard enough to get out of the house with three now. Tried to get out of the house for a soccer match for about three and a half hours now is long enough, Shane. So you're telling me that you chose going watching soccer over Boom. at Limerick against Clare? There you go. Uh, would, would you would you chose Barcelona over Tipperary? Wait, but... Uh, uh, no, no, no. You're that's not the soccer idea. over Hurling. Would you chose Barcelona over Tipperary? Barcelona uh, GA club or Barcelona Rovers? Like, Bar- you know what I mean? Bar- Barcelona, anything in Barcelona. I go with Barth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Your community is everything. And you know your community is everything. <laughs> if I try, if I gave any other answer, it just wouldn't be worthwhile. So I'm just going <laughs> to, I'm going to agree with you. Uh, yeah, I'm, yeah. Weapons are uh, They were all, <laughs> like, listen, they were all, they were all, like, they were all friends of mine. You know, like, that, that like, one of my best friends managing them, you know, or a, a coach with them, you know, like, it, they're all lads I would have played soccer with and still play hurling with. So, you know, it's, um, it's a it's it's a big big ordeal. Dad Dad would have been like the youngest uh, captain in the market Celtic, like you know. So soccer's more in his blood than it is in <laughs> in mine. So uh, it's uh, it's it's a different it's a different game. But we're 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 it's it's a massive community though in the market, like in the sense that the soccer and hurling club like work so well together, you know. So like we're 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 blessed like that. You know, both come together. We get an awful lot of players who will be accommodated to play both. You know, so we're just lucky that uh, we have the success on both sides. How much of, of soccer tactics do you think can be worked into hurling? Ah, uh, oh, it's 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 such a different game. You know, I was even saying like the other night, I came home from it and it was it was weird. Like you know, like it, it just things move so slowly. Like in the soccer match, you know, like the, the game changes. Like you you can you can change things up very quickly. You know, tactically and stuff like that. Whereas hurling, I was only having this discussion with somebody the other day. I was like, if you make a switch in hurling. You nearly need to get the message back to your half back line and full back line, like that we're after bringing on somebody because the game is moving so quickly now, like mm-hmm. that you don't have time to look up and see, like that. Uh, like uh, the point I was making was that Aaron Channer, when he went in full forward for the for the tip game, you know, I was kind of like, like did the lads know that Aaron Channer was in there, like you know, like because it took him like about five minutes to realize, and then suddenly, you know, there was two balls and there was carnage, and you know, there was a bit of chaos, like, but like. It's nearly as if like you're you're so worried the game is moving so quickly it's breathless that you have to get the message in to to say that we're we're having a bit of a change of tact here you know like we need, we need to go we've a lad in there now who's who's six foot three or four you know and you need to 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 change up how how quick the game moves but also going back to something you said there about like the Waterford and Cork game arguably you had probably the the team who have the most question marks about their backline in Cork and the team who probably are the least cutting edge in the Munster Championship in Waterford's forwards coming up against each other. So, like, it is very hard to know where either team is at. You know, I think Cork will come up against far bigger tests, um, you know, in the in the Munster Championship. And I'm kind of glad that Clare don't have them next, you know, in the sense that at least they'll be able to see maybe how they come up against a more physical element, you know, before they get to play them again. We're getting attacked now over the soccer chat. Jesus, we have to listen to soccer chat rather now than get anything but a cursory two-minute comment on Cork v Watford. Do what I thought was interesting? I was looking at Cork and their puckouts every time. Now, this could be led by the goalkeeper. It could be led by the management. I'm, obviously, we don't know. But like every time Cork had a puckout, their full back line came onto the 21. So they were trying to create a bit of structure in their own, own defence, which I think is the right way to go about it. And I was looking at Watford. It wasn't so pronounced in the second half, but in the first half, their backs, their full back line at times were like 40 yards out. And I'm thinking, if you lose a ball at the other end of the field from the puckouts, which they were doing at times, there's nothing but space in your back line. So I just thought structurally, Michael, that that Watford looked a little bit all at sea at times. It's hard to... I, I haven't seen space like that in a county game in years, lads. It was... Um, like Naive would be the word I'd use. I couldn't believe it. Um, like, if, as you say, Shane, if there was a mistake, it was open season. Like, it was... You're almost like trying to play, like, perfect hurling. Like, if they get the if they get the ball, if Waterford do win possession, yeah, maybe they have runners coming from deep and things like that. But you have to play the percentages as well. You're, they weren't able to get their hands on a load of ball. And all of a sudden, then, uh, Cork were building and it was just so many different areas that they could put the ball into there was kind of space everywhere um it's hard to believe kind of what was what was going on really at different stages in that game i, I couldn't believe it and when you, when you look you praise waterford tactically how they played against uh, limerick the week before and they got so many things right but tactically I, I couldn't believe some of the things that were going on uh yesterday but saying that we kind of flagged this as well they knew they were playing Limerick from very, very far out. They've probably been planning for Limerick from very, very far out. That first game gets so much time and so much attention. 
and the second game maybe then doesn't get as much attention. It gets what six days attention if you get me. So uh, yeah, I was just I was surprised to see what was what was going on there. And as Colin said, like, realistically, the game was over after after twenty five minutes, and they made a bit of a spurt at the start of the second half, got a couple of scores back. Uh, but Dara Fitzgibbon was just running right at different stages in the game the other day. Uh, for again another guy who didn't play a league and just hit the ground running straight away. Um, he was just causing him so much so much trouble, and it's just it's that it's that pace and the accuracy even shooting from outfield as well. Um, but again, did we learn much about Cork really yesterday? Not I'm not so sure. We learned that Brian Roach has franked his form from the league. Yeah. Like he looked a good player, and the way he shut down Jamie Barron early doors. I mean, a particular moment when Barron was trying to twist this way, turn the the next way, and he eventually dispossessed him. Got in for a goal chance, obviously didn't convert it, but like he seems like a fair old machine. Tommy O'Connell had a bit of bother at wing back, but obviously they adjusted that in time and and moved somebody else on uh, Jack Prendergast. But um, a lot of people are saying Colin about. You know, this is typical Waterford now. They folded up tents like they did last year. You know, they didn't perform last year for Liam Cahill and in the end, they didn't perform for Davy here. Other people saying, Davy, tactically, you know, is, is he not there anymore? Like, what's your read on this? I just don't think they have the core group of players, maybe, that, like, are, and, and the players to back them up. You know, I think Waterford, like, they, they have good athletic players, but, like, they just don't seem to mar well together. You know, like they don't seem to have like Tyg de Burka is the glue in a lot of ways, um, you know, that kind of pulls them together and keeps them in control. They have a lot of exceptionally good hurlers um, with loads of legs, but it takes a lot, guys, to make a team, you know, like to make a quality team at Intercounty. You know, you need a lot of cogs to fit in places, you know, like you need your, your tough cornerbacks that are able to, you know, kind of man up and mark their men. You need, you know, strong men around the middle of the park. Um, like I and, and also at Waterford, like I don't think they have enough scoring threat, you know, to from from around the field, um, to 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 pick off a lot of scores. Like Desi is a fine hurler, but like where do you play him? He doesn't have support. He's easily man marked because they don't have somebody else who's that dangerous. Um, like they just don't seem to have that uh, backup of or, or depth in their squad. You know, that allows them, like Stephen Bennett is a fantastic hurler. He's great risk, but like, you know, players know that maybe, you know, that if he doesn't get inside them, you know, like that he's okay, you keep him outside him. Like, so they, they have, they just don't have to have, an, they don't have enough threat everywhere, I think, to, to to kind of cause a lot of difficulty for teams. But like, what I'd like to see with Cork and where, what test where they're at is, like they used all their energy, Cork, in running the other day. You know, they were able to just run, 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 run here, there and everywhere and they had loads of energy. But like, you'd like to see how they cope with the energies of having to deal with hits and see if their running game is just as good after that then as well. You know, because there wasn't a hit in that game, the other, you know, yesterday. It was just... A couple it, of wrestling tackles, all right. Yeah, <laughs> but it was, it was just, it was, it was crazy to watch. Like, you know, I, I, I was watching it like in... Christ, like I'm, I'm moving slow, but I was kind of thinking like this, you know, you'd nearly, you'd nearly manage to score a couple of points if you were playing with Cork yesterday, no matter who you were, because throw you know, it out to me, yeah. just I'm loose here, throw it yeah. out to me. <laughs> <laughs> because Waterford, Waterford, like you know, just they didn't seem to want to go man for man with them, you know, or maybe they were trying to keep their structure, maybe you know, to try and make sure that they didn't concede goal chances against Cork, uh, and that they did, but like you know, you like concede was well, 28 points, you know, or whatever it was, like you know, it's. You're not going to win any Munster Championship game, you know, allowing a team to to get up that, you know, head of steam. Yeah, Michael, I, like, I thought the inaccuracy of some of Waterford's passing at times was, you know, it was just so sloppy. Um, the amount of stick passes that hit the floor and players had to turn backwards for them. I also saw a stat on the RTE coverage at one stage. Opposition puckouts won. This was after 66 minutes, 18 to 3. So that'll just tell you that Waterford weren't able to turn over the Cork puck out. And it's not like Cork are known for having a load of brilliant ball winners. Now, Cork only had that one goal chance through Brian Roach after 25 minutes or so. It was saved well by Billy Nolan. But um, I just wonder, Waterford, next week, if Austin Gleeson, like, I presume he's not starting because maybe injury and he's not fully fit to start. But you're thinking, surely, at this stage, start him, start Park Fitzgerald, start Patrick Fitzgerald, and let's just go for broke because the forwards just don't even look like scoring. Yeah, they're going to have to now. They've like they haven't hit the twenty point mark in their two games, lads. That's you're just going to get left behind in modern hurling if you're not hitting that type of mark. Um, twenty, I'd say you want more than twenty. Yeah, but they're not even hitting twenty. Yeah, do you know yeah. what I mean? Like that's that's 
Um, and like that, fair enough. They left plenty of chances behind them the first day against Limerick. They left, you know, a good few behind them yesterday as well. But they just they, at times they didn't even look that dangerous. Ah, uh, listen, I don't know. Is there is there a common team here or what? But like there was a comment in there saying that some of the water players down tools under Parik Fanning's reign, like they really need to guard against anything like that happening in this. They need they need a performance the next day. They like they have to produce something the next day. Um, they were hot enough the first day. They were fairly cold yesterday. I I, I to be honest, I, I I agree with your point, Colin, about maybe the lack of depth. But by Jesus, Liam Cattle had Waterford humming for two and a half years. Like yeah. they were humming, like they were playing beautiful stuff at different stages. They looked totally unstoppable. Um, I just there doesn't seem to be much rhyme or reason to the way they're playing at the moment. I think it's, I been honest. I think it's a bit probably overthought. I looked at Caleb Lyons solo and through yesterday in the middle of the park, totally by himself. He had about thirty yards to go into, or he had a point to take on one or the other, and he hits this ridiculous kind of diagonal ball to Desi Hutchinson I'm not having a go at him because I, I, we have waxed lyrical about him here we think he's a brilliant player but that's just a guy that's caught in a headspace of am I playing naturally here or am I trying to you know force something or do something that we've been told to do um, and that's what it looked like to me and it just looked like a team that are caught between different styles different tactics um, I don't know how instinctive it all is I put it that way you know, you know what I think is a big problem for Waterford as well is the fact that like uh, the, their club competitive or club championship is like very not is, is not competitive at the minute. You know, in terms of Ballygunner winning so much, and you know, is there a you know we're Ballygunner or we're Waterford? You know, like that sort of team developing in this squad. You know, you have Ballygunner lads obviously pulling out. You know, of the of the Waterford setup. You know, some of them are are playing, some of them aren't. You know, and it's a bit like the the down scenario above. You know that like you had lads playing with um, what's the club? Kill um, Kilku and not playing with down. You know, like and it, it, like it doesn't help when you're when when one team is so dominant in in their championship. You know, and that their club championship isn't. And I know people might make the argument to Bally Hale or whatever. You know, but Kilkenny is thoroughbred hurling. You know, and all the you know all the teams, you know Belly Hale, yeah, they're being successful, but the other teams are still bringing on players, and everybody from Belly Hale plays with Kilkenny. You know, like they 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 want to play with Kilkenny and they want to be successful with Kilkenny, and I just wonder, like, is this Waterford team suffering? You know, on the back of Belly Gunner now winning an awful lot of championships. You know, these these players are trying to win club championships, and some of them are probably turning around with their own clubs and kind of saying, "What's the point now?" You know, like, is there an awful lot of, you know, players being lost to the system because of it, you know, and how Waterford are going to manage that? It's obviously been a problem at underage now. It's it's stemming right down along. And, you know, unless they get the, uh, you know, the right structures in place, you know, they're going to go down a deep, dark hole very, very quickly. You know, and Michael, you know it very well how, how a team can slip. Mm. You know, Claire, we're worried about that in recent years. And thankfully, you know, like, there's phenomenal work being done in the academies, you know, through Rob Mulcahy and... You know, Dole Maloney, even after managing the, the, the Clare Seniors, goes back to be Clare 15s and sets up a, you know, a Clare 15s competition with all the schools, you know, that have Clare lads playing in them, you know, and kind of, and, and it starts to steamroll again. But, you know, Waterford, I think structurally, I think there's an awful lot more at play maybe in terms of what's going to happen to them down the line if, if they don't get their house in order. There is yeah, a genuine, genuine worry that Waterford are going to, from Waterford folk that they're going to slip off the radar in three or four years when Jamie Barron, Austin Gleeson, Ty De Borca, etc., uh, exit. Um, and it's not, yeah, they're caught, yeah, it, it, it is, it's worrying. Yeah, I mean, to some degree, like you kind of said the same about Wexford last week, but if you look at the Waterford 20s there the other night against Tipperary, and they didn't have the, the three Fitzgeralds playing, and Mark Fitzgerald is a brilliant prospect, and obviously the two Fitzgeralds uh, forwards are also, but there was like, a, is it Jack Toomey was the lad who was playing in the full forward line, and he scored that goal oh, with yeah. the flick over the head, and they were very competitive with Tip and could have won that game, even though they were down lads, so, I mean, I know what you're saying, but they need to manage the players coming through, whoever's coming through, and whoever they have who's just been in the senior panel in the last year or two. Yeah, they need to manage everything right now or they could have a bit of slippage. Just in terms of what the two managers said after this game, 
Pat Ryan says there was a bit of negativity after the Kilkenny game, just the league semi final. And obviously, we'd like to have played a bit better, but I think it was a blessing in disguise in the end. The way Inter County is now, if you're not going to work hard, you're not going to get anything. Uh, we've been accused at times in Cork of not working hard enough. I don't think we can be, be accused of that today. And on the other side, Davey Fitz said, it's easy to assess the performance. It was absolutely terrible. Lack of energy, lack of drive. It was just very disappointing. I'd love to tell you why. I just don't know. Uh, it wasn't the same team that lined out last week. Maybe it was something we I got wrong during the week. I don't know. That desire to get the ball in front. If you let Cork get to the ball, they're going to hurt you. And they did that today. We've known to look at only ourselves. We weren't energetic and we let them dictate everything. It wasn't good enough. I mean, like a week after Clare lost to Tipperary, they produced that performance against Limerick. So I don't think we can just put it down to energy alone, Michael. Just a final word on this game. Yeah, no, you can't put it down to energy alone. Um, because you know, in one way, you're after you're after throwing it down to the All Ireland champions, and you surely you think you realise maybe we're a bit better than we thought we are. Maybe we're closer than we thought we are. But again, there is the physical toll that that comes with that, and Clare more aware than anybody else about the physical toll that comes with actually throwing it down to Limerick and being really competitive with them. It'd be fascinating to see how Clare play in two weeks' time on the back of that, um, uh, from a Waterford point of view. You know, can they produce anything here? Can they somehow conjure two wins and end up on four points in what would probably be a really, really messy looking table with a lot of teams on similar enough points and what could what could end up coming down to head to heads? Like, but Watford are the only ones without points now, and it, God, you'd you'd be probably a brave man to say that they're going to end up with points at the end of the two games just based on how they how they played yesterday. Colin, you've been great with your time. Uh, we won't keep you much longer. Who's going to come out a monster? Oh, oh, um, uh, oh God. Listen, uh, Claire, Tip and Limerick. Claire, Tip and Limerick. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think it, I, it I just like... I I I think and and the reason for that before any Cork people cut me is I just think like this Cork have obviously you know Claire Limerick and Tip to play and I think you know they're they're going to come up against a lot more physical battles than what they did against Waterford yesterday and I think people will probably read into them you know being back and you know having a new manager after scoring so much yesterday but. Munster Championship takes an awful lot more, you know, to to win than just throwing points over. You know, and Cork have have seen that down through the years, and I I just think maybe that they're not as physical as, and I do, you know, I do, I just don't think they're going to match up with Clare. They might beat one of them, but I just don't think they're going to match up physically with all of them. You know, in in a couple of weeks in a row, and I possibly think Clare will beat Waterford. It's hard to know. It, it could come down to Clare v Cork in the last round in Cusick Park. You I know, know, and I'd like- have taken. Yeah, I was going to say, and Claire obviously haven't won the monster since you were in short pants back in nineteen ninety eight. So it would be like, is this going to be the year? Uh well, like you're you're looking at a monster. I think everybody still has all Ireland. Uh, everybody still has hopes so they're not Ireland. Um, no more than po- possibly the football, um, like the provincial championships. I think the round robin in Munster is nearly more relevant than the Munster final <laughs> like you know in the sense that everybody's just looking to be top three I think and get into the All-Ireland um, like uh, Claire, I go I go back to when we won the All-Ireland in 2013 and, and Limerick won Munster um, like that killed Limerick like even though they hadn't won a Munster in so long you know when you get an opportunity and you get to an All-Ireland it's an All-Ireland you want like that's the pinnacle that's the be all and end all and I think all these competitions are just nearly, you know, kind of, um, I, I suppose, warming up to get into the All-Ireland Series and making sure, obviously, in Munster, it's so cutthroat that you have to get into the All-Ireland Series. You have to, you know, come at it a bit quicker. It's so much easier for the likes of Galway and Kilkenny to ramp up their their preparations a lot differently. You know, like, you come out of Munster, blood and bandages, you know, ready for a, a an All-Ireland Series, you know, whereas Kilkenny and Galway can probably you know, kind of ease their way into it, especially after the draw yesterday. You know, both teams are primed to um to to come out of Leinster and, you know, it's it's just gonna be a case of what three out of the four teams come out of Munster. I can't see Waterford coming out. Um but it it's it's gonna be a different scenario um and it's gonna be intriguing to watch over the next couple of weeks. Yeah, sure. Well, we'd love to keep you on for the rest of it, but I'm sure you have to go minding the babbies or something at this stage. <laughs> Thank Colin Monday. Yeah, there's three of them running around now looking to do something. We'll send them out of the house to be grand. Great stuff, Colin. Appreciate it. And we'll chat to you again Here's soon. Cheers, Colin. Always great to have Colin on. Good old fun and great analysis, too.
Yeah, a good, a good lad. Yeah, broke me heart and broke me heart and Nina one day in the colleges, the colleges semi final. He hooked me twice, put me out over the side, and I think he laughed it over the two lion balls. Then <laughs> that's, <laughs> that what, that's what he could do, brilliant player. Um, so Leinster obviously was on over the weekend as well. We start off with Kilkenny and Galway, twenty eight points to one twenty five. Now, like we're going to bring in the loud and awfully performance here in the in the Leinster football semi final, and Sam Mulroy hadn't been having a great game for Loud and obviously he came up with the goods an extra time as Loud got the victory there and Mickey Hart was asked about it and he said you don't take Messi off and you know obviously we're not really trying to compare these players to Messi but at the flip side Henry Shefflin he took off Connor Cooney and he took off Connor Whelan and Connor Whelan especially the last few years has been the go-to guy and somebody that you and I have when we've done like top five rating of top five players in Ireland we've talked about him regularly so obviously we really highly rate him but Henry decided, boys, you're not getting it done. Off you come. Threw in a couple of young lads, Liam Collins and Declan McLaughlin. They split the posts. And Galway, who had been struggling to get these scores, they pulled it out of the bag. I think that was... Like, obviously, it's brave from Mickey Hart in a way, but no one blames him for leaving him on. Whereas Henry put his neck on the block and it paid off. Yeah, this was the thing maybe about Sam Mulroy is that Loud maybe rely on him. Yeah, you know you know what I mean? You these make... boys, Galway rely on these boys. Yeah, true. Maybe not to the same to the same extent. Like a lot of people would say that you know Mulroy is not only their best player, but he's you know built their ta- attack is built around him. I think you I think you Lawler has not that he has Whelan's number, but he just seems to match up well with him physically, and he seems to be, like in the first half even he was able to burst out and get to a couple of balls. Did you see the rob actually in the first half where Lawler had no hurl out? It was he might have been fouled. It was a foul. <laughs> might one of them might have been fouled, but he just ne- nips in with the hand. Um, that was that was brilliant. But yeah, listen, Henry, it's probably the perfect scenario for Henry in that. He showed his squad that if you're showing up well in training, you will play. If X or Y or Colin or um, Connor Cooney or Connor Whelan aren't showing up. Doesn't matter who you are in a game. We will take you off. We will throw whoever in. It was the perfect scenario for them. Um, and you know the two lads came in and got scores. Just from a Kilkenny point of view, like they were in, they were in, kind of in control. Should have been in control of that final few minutes and should have maybe controlled the the, the final play a lot better. Like TJ putting that line ball dead was a strange one. Uh, it just gave Galway another opportunity. I thought he would have been putting it into the corner or playing a short one, trying to hold on to possession, maybe work a free. Um, but fair play to Galway. I haven't looked at different stages in the game that it might be slipping away from them. They just kept kind of trucking away. And yeah, good to see some new faces kind of standing up and getting scores when they when they really needed to. And realistically, they got a point out of a scenario where it looked like they were going to leave empty-handed. Yeah, I mean, were you impressed by Kilkenny in this game? I was for spells. They were winning rocks. They were getting the ball out of there, but um, and t- converting it into scores. They all, all six of their forwards had scored from play by thirty six minutes. Yet to not see that game out, that's very un Kilkenny like. And I'm just wondering, is is it getting to the stage now where we're starting to see the the shortcomings in the panel? You know, Connor Brown isn't there. Richie Lahey isn't there. Um, James Maher. There's one other obvious name that I'm Mikey forgetting. Mikey Carey about. was actually Mikey is, Carey, the most had, obvious had, had been had been away, but by all accounts, he was um he's involved in the squad or was with the extended squad the other day. He'd been travelling and is back, I think. But I don't know if he's involved in the training squad or whatever. But just go, go on to say, are you are we seeing kind of on Kilkenny like things happening basically like in the in games where they're letting teams back in maybe when the door should be shut normally they would sort of close that out wouldn't they and you know there was a couple of rows late in the game and you'd normally think that that would fire up Kilkenny especially in front of a home crowd but no and like if you look at it this year the manner of the defeat to Tipperary in the league then draw in a game that they'd normally win now to be fair Galway went there four years ago and they won on a day when Joe Canning was out injured so that showed that Galway aren't you know, all that afraid. And Brian Cannon was on fire in this brilliant, game. Like he, yeah, brilliant. He was absolutely brilliant. But TJ Reid didn't look to be motoring too well. As I said, I watched one of the games with the father. I was watching the other one with the mother. And she said, he just doesn't seem to be moving that well because he seems to be looking to pop the ball off very quickly. He got one from play. But, you know, outside of Owen Cody, and I thought John Donnelly, sure, look, we were always on about him. Thought he was very good, Adrian. Hands, Mullen, hands, hands his hands oh. are outrageous. And he's such Lovely quick hands, hands as well. Like, he was one-third of uh, the ginger half-forward line for Kilkenny as well. I'm not sure if you noticed that. But, um, 
yeah. Oh yeah, Timmy one? Timmy Clifford is as well. Yeah, that's right. Timmy yeah, Clifford, yeah. Adrian Mullen, yeah. and um, and and obviously John Donnelly. Much ado about nothing. Bringing that we up. We talked anyway. about we talked about this before though. Uh, Brian Whelan was was a redhead. Henry Shefflin was a redhead. Richie Powers a redhead. A lot of the greatest hurlers that have ever played the game have had red hair. And I'm, we're li- keen. It, we're leaving out a heap more as well. Um, yeah. I don't know what that is, but listen, we'll have to do a top ten gingers, won't we? <laughs> I don't know how well that go down. Now, to be honest with you, we get Nicole Kidman in there somehow as well. <laughs> um, just on yeah, like. Kilkenny totally turned the screw at the start of the second half and you're you're kind of you know if you'd looked in with 15 or 20 minutes to play you'd wonder how they would not win the game and I think yeah. that would be disappointed from from Derek Ling's point of view um, that they just didn't see it out there's, like there's a couple of things maybe have happened like I don't know against against Limerick in the league final I wouldn't say the true in the towel but it, it wasn't a, maybe a Kilkenny a typical Kilkenny finish where you know, they left everything out there and stayed going till the very end. And the other day, they had themselves in a winning position. Tony Dorn was a redhead as well, Martin Furlong. He surely was. Um, another, another another, one to add to that list. I think we talked about that before on the show. Uh, just on TJ, well, like, age might be coming into it as well, but he definitely doesn't look like he can cover the ground that, that he did before. Um, particularly without the ball. I don't think he's... I don't know if he's able to... Um, maybe defend as well as he would have been before. I think he's more kind of shadowing almost now, whereas before he was, you know, tracking 60, 70 yard runs. I think teams maybe potentially are going to try and put him on the back foot now and going to try and make him maybe defend a bit more because it doesn't look like maybe he's moving as freely as possible. Now, one of our commenters had it in earlier. It was a bad weekend for free takers. Basically, accept him. That's the one thing that you are guaranteed with TJ that you know, nearly every uh, place ball is going to be dealt with with the utmost of care, and he he just doesn't he really miss. Twenty one against Galway last year. Yeah, he was pulled off at half time the same day too. Yeah, and like mm. we, what 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 exactly are you trying to prove with that comment? I'm just trying to catch you out. TJ is still a brilliant free taker. Just not, happy to catch you out. I don't think I don't think you're catching me out. We're talking about the game yesterday uh, in particular. <laughs> Shami Callan missed. I, I saw Shami Callan. Uh, Miss uh miss a uh, free from twenty one to Fitzgibbon as well. He missed one in league game against Clare in Cusick Park. Too. Like, two what? actually, that's it. Yeah. So like, you know. well, what, what's this? Uh, you know, I mean, out of nowhere, back and poor old Jamie Cowan. Well, I don't know if you're gonna, if you just, your, your comment was a, was a throwaway, was a throwaway remark. But just on yesterday, did it seem like the blood and thunder of a? A championship game at stage of the second half, maybe to talk to Kenny came out with a different intent after half time, but probably not in the first half at different stages. I have to say, I have to give a word to Connor Fogarty as well. And I kind of said it, we kind of said it in the preview show like that game was tailor made for him yesterday. A tighter kind of ground, loads of big hits, loads of physical uh confrontations. I thought he was brilliant at different stages and kind of left it, left himself, left himself, uh, or taken off a couple of minutes to go, having emptied himself, but. Yeah, I think Kilkenny would be disappointed if they didn't see it out a lot better. Yeah, I thought Joseph Cooney could have been a bit more careful with his shot selection. And there's a comment here from Stephen Loftus. Finton Burke needs to be starting to get Joseph Cooney up to the forward line. Um, Kevin Cooney shows flashes at times. I'd say there's more to come from him. You can see, though, that Henry is looking at the next generation and he's he's having to trust him. Like, he's putting Keenan Fahey out midfield, Ronan Glennon, um, you know, a couple of other players like that. And, like, they are playing pretty well. And they're developing, but like they, they're not going to get up to that championship pace in terms of consistency unless he leaves them out there. Like from a Kilkenny point of view, you know, you're you're salt to the earth, you're dyed in the wool, Kilkenny man yourself. Oh yeah. Yeah. What do you make of, of the setup here? Like, so you've got Parik Walsh there, he's obviously taken off, but you know, he's been, been such a brilliant player. But interesting to see him taken off. David Blanchfield and Dara Corcoran, two lads in the middle eight, two big physical guys, Timmy Clifford, how did he do? Keen Kenny, he came in for Parik Walsh after 46 minutes. And I think refs have kind of just noticed now that he goes into contact and puts the two arms up straight away. He's not getting the freeze. His tackling probably comes... It's interesting that he seemed to be very much quickly established as a trusted lieutenant under Brian Cody. But Derek Ling doesn't seem to fancy him that much. But I actually think the positions that Derek Ling has used him in hasn't suited it. Like, he's been used half-back, midfield. Like centre forward. Maybe that, centre forward. Maybe that idea... Uh, that Cody did last year against Dublin in the round robin game, play him sort of as a third inside forward who comes and roams. 
maybe do a bit more damage there. But anyway, broadly speaking, the Kilkenny players who are trying to establish themselves under Derek Ling, what are you making of that? Derek, Derek Corkin had a big second half. I'm a big fan of David Blanchfield, as as you well know. Uh, I think his distribution of the ball has gotten a lot better. He doesn't maybe take on those kind of long shots uh, as much as as much as he did before. Um, yeah, Parik Walsh having played that kind of Barry Nash style number four all the way through the league, they seem to have abandoned that. He's just playing wing back now. It was probably quiet by by his standards um, the other day. Timmy Clifford had kind of flat. Ashes, um, Donnelly was very, very Sorry good. Sorry to cross you, Mike, yeah. but like you're talking about the like, and we both see the value in trying Park Walsh in a in a Barry Nash type role of driving forward and all that. But he was man marking players at corner back at times, yeah, like in the two, yeah. like against Aaron Gallan, it just didn't make sense. So I'm wondering, is Derek Ling looking at what he tried and being like, Do you know what, let's it's safer to put Park Walsh wing back instead. Well, I think the thing is, is that if you're an opposition manager and you see Park Walsh lining out a cornerback, you know what role he wants to play. So he wants to play that drifting out kind of role where he's going to play. He's kind of nearly an auxiliary halfback or in around centre back. So we're, if I was an opposition manager, I'm sure you'd be the same. You're going to say, we're going to get him to mark. And we're going to get him to mark a dangerous inside forward. And we're going to put him where he doesn't want to be. Like cornerback is the most unforgiving position in the world. If like if there's some difference between playing the Barry Nash kind of roving role and marking in the full oh. back line. It's good, like it's their worlds apart. And I think a good few opposition managers have maybe cottoned on to that and Derek Ding probably realised we'd probably need to release this lad to the wing back wing back slot, slot maybe. But again, he, he probably was disappointed kind of by his standards yesterday. Still not sure. I haven't still I don't know. I haven't got a you know, a really a proper read on Kilkenny. And when are you going to get a proper read on them now as well? Really, they've played the second best team or the best team in Leinster yesterday. Probably the next time you're going to get a really, really, really accurate read is probably in the Leinster final when they play the same opposition again. But again, that's a different world to go and play in Limerick or go and play in Clare or even go and play in Tip in a quarter final slash semi final. So hard to know what to make out. All I know is that they'd be they'd be disappointed to have left a point behind yesterday because they had it in their hands and just didn't see it out well. Yeah, Alan Fitzgerald might tell us if he's a Limerick man. Strange that the head high tackles are not worth a mention this week. Are they only dangerous and need to be wiped from the game if a Limerick player does it? Do you know there was a there was a time when Jack Grealish I can't remember who the who Mikey Butler. Was, Mikey Butler. He didn't connect with his head. And you know, it was kind of like, so I thought the most was made of that by Mikey Butler. And they showed the replay a couple of times. He did not make contact with his head. And it was interesting to see Henry Shefflin at yeah. Nolan Park shouting about shouting to the referee and the linesman about players jumping on the floor. So saying that about, you know, the county that he's so famous for playing. You know, yeah. it's very interesting to see that happen because, you know, you'd probably... It'd be understandable if he felt a little bit sheepish going down to Nolan Park with an opposition team first time in championship. But he's like, no, nah, I'm here with this team and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make all the calls for them. Yeah, I think it's kind of admirable, really. Would, yeah. would, he, be, would he be doing that somewhere? If the game has been played somewhere else, would he be doing that in Salt Hill? I'd say, I'd say he would. Now, would he be would he be doing it if Brian Cody was on the line? Would he be accused that Brian Cody managed team of diving? Is not maybe another story? But Well, after like, what happened last year, I'd say he wouldn't care. Maybe so, but he was he's definitely all in anyway. I'll put it to you that way. Um that it was it was it was strange to see it though. It definitely was was uh was strange to see it. Um I think I think Galway got more out of that game probably than Kilkenny did, just by the fact that they got a, a heap of new faces in, they all made a mark, particularly near the end. I agree with John Kevin Cooney. There are flashes just probably a couple of bad enough wides from good opportunities. But there are definitely flashes where you're thinking this lad could could catch light. Like he's good ball winner. He's good striker. He's more he's mobile. He's kind of awkward but in not a bad way necessarily. He offers it pose a different kind of a problem. But could I see him, you know, hitting four points in a big championship game later on this year? I probably could. Mm, uh Com MP Co Productions, I think. Com P Co. Anyway, since he loves early power rankings uh, beyond belief, who do you think is the front runner for Herder of the Year? Wow. Um, front Ryan runner. Taylor. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's just he's. I don't know. The All Star Committee don't seem to see see, see what we see within within him anyway. Um, John Conlon potentially just at the moment. Um, if Claire Shane O'Donnell will be in the mix, like who what Limerick player are you pulling out at the moment? Probably Tom Morrissey, maybe. 
Yeah, I mean, Kyle Hayes has had some moments as well, to be fair. But yeah, probably Tom Morrissey more so. Um, yeah, Jake Here's, Morris, one, here's well, one for you. I said this to somebody the other day. Will Garoad Hegarty still win an All-Star this year? After a red card, being brought on as a sub and probably not doing what we expect him to normally do, he's going to have to have a huge... Well, like, potentially they still have another five, six games left, depending yeah. on what route they go. So, yeah, it could and happen. He, and realistically, he's going to be rated on potentially a Munster final, All Ireland semi final, and the All Ireland final. So I think he actually probably still win and will win an All Star. Owen Cody was mentioned there. Owen Cody was br- like he was brilliant oh. yesterday. Um, there was uh, there was just a co- like there's a couple of balls that he got his hands on. I don't know how he did. Like he just he he's even down low, and then there was that stage, and we'll chat about now in a second. Like. When he when he soloed in a championship match with his left hand, <laughs> that is like I I haven't seen anything like that before, and it gets us to talk about the greatest feats of uh, ambidexterity in the GA. But that is that is definitely one I I've never seen anything like that before. There was a one in tennis, um, Sharapova when she was caught to one side, she used to play a, a, a her left hand on top, a double handed backhand. Uh, and it's just really weird to see. Obviously, Ronnie O'Sullivan is probably one of the greatest uh, ambidextrous players in the history of any sport. But other, give us a couple of other kind of GA instances, maybe. Yeah, did you say Lee Chin took a free on his weaker side over the yeah, weekend? Yeah, yeah. Um, not the stand side, the terrace side. The, the, Wexford had a free near the end. They took it off his left-hand side. I'm wondering whether that's... Um, whether that's him showing that he can take off both sides or whether there was an issue with his shoulder or something maybe at the end of the game. But I think Rory O'Connor ended up getting a point out of it. Um, obviously, two of the best footballers we oh, have at the moment are, was, yeah. are, are both both left and right. And I know Walsh was kind of... Um, it was queried on the Sunday game recently about him taking a free off or a 45 off his left-hand side that was kind of in the middle. And But uh, they're obviously two of the two of the best. Like they're, what's the, It's not ambidextrous. They're... What's the word for it? Well, I made up the word pedidextrous, but I didn't, I don't actually think it's a word. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go with that. Do you know, there's plenty of snooker players out there who play with both sides. Um, Brissell tried it the other night. Obviously, he's in the final. No, lots of them tried it. I can't think of other ones off the top Anthony of my head. Anthony McGill but... tried it the other night and missed missed an awful shot playing left-handed uh, in, in one of his games in one of the crucial frames against Sai in the quarter final actually Trump what's his right nickname what's, what's Anthony McGill's nickname oh I don't know McGilly Cody Reeks maybe I'm going to look it up here and see if we can find it um, I'm not the sure Smiling Assassin it. Licensed to Thrill the Glaswegian Gladiator and the Glasgow Bus so yeah the best the best nicknames are in snooker though aren't they the Thunder from Down Under that was um um what you call Neil Robertson. Neil Robertson, the ace in the pack. It's Judge Trump. Uh, Anthony Hamilton. The, uh, the Robin Hood of snooker. The sheriff of Pottingham. Yeah, was he not called the Robin Hood of snooker at one stage as well? No, maybe. The, the yeah, sheriff of Pottingham nothing. is amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I saw a comment there at one stage, people asking who's going to win, or there was one commenter asking who's going to win between Mark Selby and um, and Luca Brissell. So it's 9-8 Brissell at the moment. Yesterday, I didn't really get a chance to watch much of it. I was at the Crucible earlier in the week, as we talked about, and I've booked tickets for next year for both the semi-final and final, and I can't wait to get back there. But, um, geez, Brissell is brilliant to watch. It couldn't be more of a clash of styles, oil and water. Completely different. I thought Selby would win handy now, to be honest, which I thought he'd have not broken down with the, the second session. But I think Selby will win about 18-14. Cannot see him losing. Cannot see him losing. Yeah, but you couldn't see Brissell winning when he was 15, was a 14-5 behind against C and when he had to win seven in a row against so Ronnie. Outrageous. Yeah, that's <laughs> true, yeah. That's true, yeah. Maybe, maybe his name is on the trophy. I don't think so, but maybe. And he's class to watch as well. Anyway, keep your comments coming in. There's so much to talk about from all the games over the weekend. Wexford beat Antrim. And, like, I think Wexford were nine points ahead at half time, and ultimately they won this game by five. And they were outscored by 16 points to 11 in the second half. James Lawler is obviously the goalkeeper these days, now that Mark Fanning is no longer between the sticks. He had to make quality saves from Neil McManus and Conal Cunning in the second half. So Antrim, like, they're franking their form here in a big way after drawing with Dublin. 
Darren Gleeson said afterwards, they got away from us during the opening stages of the first half. We rushed things, made mistakes, which they capitalized upon. Second half brought, brought much improvement. We made huge improvements. A lot of things went well, but we still missed some crucial scoring chances. Still, we met the challenge in the second half, created chances, and with a little look close to goals, we could have added a further goal or two. So that was the battle of North Tipperary, Darry Egan against Darren Gleeson. And Michael Kendi from Tipperary was refereeing the game as well. It was just a bit yeah. mad, really. Uh, this game looked like it was like all over after about 15 or 20 minutes. Wexford had scored 112 and it was all from play. Um, and they'd, as you said, they'd 119 on the board at half time. In fairness to Antrim, they threw, they threw um, caution to the wind in the second half, got, gave, you know, got it really, really tight and made Wexford uh, score them coming down the home straight. But this is a different type of Wexford team, even the setup. They, uh, like at various stages, they had six forwards playing in the six forwards positions. Rory O'Connor was inside. He uh, he ended up with seven points from play. He's just I I can understand why you would move him out at different stages, get him on the ball, and he's so good as well. But he's so dangerous. He ended up with seven from play. Chin, who started quite slowly, come back from that AC joint injury in his shoulder, he ended up with six from play as well. Carl Dunbar got the goal. Jack O'Connor was rewarded for uh, for a second half performance when he came in off the bench against Galway. He was brilliant as well. Hit five points. Um, uh, very worryingly for them though Liam Ryan went off injured uh, just before half time so they play Dublin this weekend and that is a big worry um, you see what Wexford when they have everybody on the pitch how competitive they can be but when they're missing Liam Ryan don't know if Damien Reck will be back next weekend he wasn't in the 26 at all um, Chin being back now obviously uh, presuming his shoulder is okay is very very encouraging for them Um yeah, I think they just need to have that more of an attacking threat like they did the other. Need to kind of find that balance between being defensively solid, having lots of bodies behind the ball, but still having two to three really dangerous men up front that can put up big tallies. Um, so I expect to see O'Connor inside again the next day. Maybe, uh, yeah, there'll be an interesting battle there potentially with Owen O'Donnell or someone like that. Yeah, um, funny enough, I mentioned Kildangan and Portru, which is where Dara Egan and Darren Gleeson are from. There's about 10 miles between the two of them. They were both on the sideline for Tipperary in uh, a few years ago, or involved at Tipperary at different stages as well. So they'd know each other very well. In fact, one was goalkeeper and the other was sub goalkeeper. Yeah, remember, right, yeah. remember, they were both vying yeah. for the same position. So, I mean, like Antrim have been doing quite well. Obviously, that result against Dublin was very good considering how Dublin put away Westmead at the weekend. But, um, like Wexford again, it's the injuries just seem to be cropping up all the time. And, you know, that's the case for a lot of teams. It's not just them. But um, Dublin got things back on track with a 223 to 125 win over uh, Westmead. Very interesting, the comments afterwards coming from Joe Fortune. Yeah, it was. Um, and I don't know if Michal done it. Sorry, I had to score wrong there. It was 223 to 114. Yeah, there was it. It was comfortable enough in the second half by all accounts. But I don't know. Dunhu and Joe Fortune obviously had some sort of an interaction after the game when they shook hands or whatever. But this is Joe Fortune's kind of reading on it. So um, it just says here the smile was wiped off me Dublin's boss or uh, Dublin boss Mial Dunhu's face afterwards as his Westmead counterpart Joe Fortune blasted him for di for disappointing comments. Fortune claimed that Dunhu accused Wexford or Westmead of negative tactics and of rough play. This is far to Fortune's quotes here. I spent long enough here to know the respect to give to Parnell Park and to that Dublin team. We go out to play hurling with them. I was just very disappointed with some of the comments that came at the end. Very disappointed uh, in defending the side's approach and, and any suggestion of being overly physical. Fortune said, I'll give you a photo of our tactical setup for the day. There was never a comment or a direction in any way, shape or form in regards to that. So don't know what sort of... Um, were there some funny tackles? There was some off the ball stuff going on. Don't don't really know. This kind of game was a bit off Broadway, so um, it'd be very interesting to hear from somebody who was was there at the game um, to see what was going on off the ball or whatever. But comfortable enough from Dublin. Uh, I don't know. I kind of enjoy shots being fired after the after the game. Um, I'd say when Michal Dunn, who said something to Joe Fortune, he didn't think it was going to end up in a public forum, but. That's the way, and that's not been smart. That's the beauty of interviews within five or ten minutes after a game because people say what they're actually thinking rather than having time to cool down and being all, um, you know, methodical and robotic or whatever. I, I, I have to say I, I enjoy that. Uh, as do I. Detox101 says, no further talk about the snooker until you film your duel, lads. We'll have to get out on the snooker table soon enough. Maybe just one frame shootout. 
What do you think? It's like five years in the making. No, I'm more of a Mark Shelby. I prefer to grind you down over 35 frames. Anybody can win one frame. Yeah, but like, who's going to tune in for 35 frames of us mishitting shots and every ball going down to the black because we're so rubbish? I shouldn't be saying this on air, but when you're over there next year, it's £35 to get into the Ding Jung Hui Snooker Academy for access for the whole day to play on his tables that look like you're playing on glass and have under table heating. So we can talk about that more off air, but that's definitely something you need to do when you're over there next year. Was his nickname, who was the, um, obviously you probably wouldn't go down too well uh, these days, but who had the nickname Pot Noodle in snooker? Oh, I don't, I don't remember that one now. It was Ding Jun Hui. It was Ding Jun Hui. Obviously, that nickname's not going to fly anymore, but, you know, there you go. I've um, never heard, heard him referred to as that, no, I have to say. Have you not? Okay, yeah. okay. Martin Furlong says, could dropping McDonald be a positive and put some fire back in his belly? Obviously, he's referring to Wexford here. Ray, going in hard, says, McDonald never kicked on from his underage days. I know he wasn't helped with the role he had with Davey. But, yeah, it was interesting to see him not start. He was brought on after 46 minutes, but... um. You know, will that change when Wexford go to Croke Park rather than Parnell Park to face Dublin? And I know it was talked about last night on the Sunday game, but really, because of Dub how good Dublin are at Croke, or sorry, Parnell Park relative to Croke Park, just doesn't make a whole pile of sense to me. But um, just to reflect on who Dublin did Dublin scoring, Donald Burke scored 1-9, Keane Boland 1-2, Paul Crummy, Connor Burke, Danny Sutcliffe and Alex Considine, they all scored two points each. So plenty of different scores. Kieran Doyle scored nine points. Niall Mitchell scored a goal. Owen Keyes with a couple of points. And a few other lads got some scores. Just a as quick well. one there, Shane. Killian Doyle was still out for Westmead, which is obviously a big loss. And while Keno Sullivan didn't end up on the score and uh, on the score sheet for Dublin, he set up the two goals by all accounts as well. That's after He's, hitting six. He's an excellent Yeah, player. that's after hitting six points the week before. Um, and just on the Connor Mack one, uh, it seemed to me like from what I was listening to, to Tom Dempsey and Billy Byrne and Liam Spratt and South East Radio, they seem to be rotating their six forwards. Um, so I don't know if it's a case of Connor not, Mack maybe not fitting into that rotation, as in he plays inside and that's generally where he only plays. And maybe it doesn't offer him playing, doesn't offer them the same flexibility. But having someone like him coming in and with a point to prove. Um, if he doesn't start against Dublin next weekend, like you know, you know what he can do under a high ball. Uh, he's so dangerous uh, when he's on his game. So be interested to see what they do with him or whether they leave him off again. Yeah. Okay. Moving on to the Christie Ring Cup. Uh, Derry one nineteen, Mead one twenty one, London two twenty two, Mayo twenty one points, and Sligo twenty points, Tyrone one fifteen. Jesus, London really seem to be getting it done this year. Big time, yeah, big time. You know that Ronan Crowley. I think he. Uh, knocked over a good few scores again. Jack Golding, they used to play with Kerry. Um, it's a good bit tighter than I thought it would be. I thought me did run out comprehensive enough winners. They were obviously beaten by London last week, only beat Derry by two points. Um, you could throw a blanket over to six teams in it, which is great for any competition. It's absolutely ideal. And Saigo had a two point win over Toronto as well. Um, I fly down through the Rick, then Nicky Rackard. Uh, Wicklow had a comprehensive win over Armad, finished 328 to 38. Donegal, 2.25, Roscommon, 2.16. I think that books their place in the final. And Loud and Fermanagh finished 3.17 apiece. In the Laurie Mara Cup, it finished Lan uh, Cavan, 3.29, Lancashire, 5.9. And Lancashire have been going really well up until that point. Um, Ferdy Harrow in defeat for uh, Warwickshire finished Monaghan, 2.26. Uh, Warwickshire won four. I think Niall Arthur put up a big score for Monaghan. And on the opposite end of the scale, they finished Longford, 12 points. Leitrim A points like that. Like Was Niall Arthur not playing for Loud a couple of years ago? Uh, I he's definitely playing for Monaghan now. He, he uh, remember I was saying to you earlier that they played a round of the Monaghan Senior Hurling Championship to get he a He was play. playing with them in 2018 anyway. Yeah, he might have been. I'm fairly sure he's playing with Monaghan now anyway. I think I was reading the report only this morning. Uh, but they played around at the Monaghan Senior Hurling Championship basically to get him eligible off the record, but also on the record. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and just a quick one in the Leinster Under-20 Hurling Championship. Offaly had a right good win over Galway the other day, 320 to 217. And Wexford beat Westmead, 316 to 312. Just on the Offaly win, uh, uh, Galway were obviously without a couple of senior players. Um, they obviously Henry Shefflin obviously took precedent with those players and wanted them to play Offaly had Charlie Mitchell playing because the seniors weren't playing last weekend which really really worked in our favour um, Adam Screeny went off with what looked like a concussion 
uh, and Brecken Cavanagh took a really heavy heavy knock as well, and they still won. Shane Rigney was brilliant. I think he finished up at one four, and the mullet Carmack Egan came on and got a goal as well, having switched his attention from football to hurling. That's a huge win for Offaly because I I thought we'd be under pressure there, and the odds suggest we would have been under pressure, but uh, like Leinster has kind of been blown blown wide open with that as well. Yeah, and obviously Tipperary had that good win against um, Waterford the other evening. So it'll be Tipperary against Clare in the under-20 semi-final with Cork waiting at the other end. And Ben O'Connor, he was doing an interview afterwards. And, you know, we've touched on it plenty about players who are under-20 and, you know, if they're in with the seniors as well, stop being playing within... You know, basically, it's it's a conversation we've seen all of last week. Conor Laverty talked about it as well, as if the managers are going to flog these players within seven days, you know, but it is nice to have them available. But anyway, I think the problem is over the years, players haven't been managed well by management teams. So, I mean, at the same time, there is that, you know. I think the big issue with this is, um, and I don't, there's, this, I was reading something yesterday this, about how this is one of the most kind of uncertain championships. It's so uncertain, as in you don't know what's going on. This is, They were even talking about the football, but with the hurling, like, at least last year, this is not any silver lining, but at least you knew the under twenties couldn't play both. Whereas now, given how fixtures and depending on whether you win or lose games, you just don't know whether you have a player available to you. Like it's even messier than before. And as I said to you, it seems to me like Central Council have blatantly changed the ruling that Wexford proposed at Congress. It is fundamentally different than uh than the ruling that they put to Congress and it's made things really, really messy. Really messy. Okay, and uh, SSRI says 12 of that West Mead under 20 team eligible next year. Good potential there. Okay, we want to talk a small bit about the football because you know there was plenty going on over the weekend. And like I said, I was watching a bit of GA with the father, a bit with the mother, and the mother was saying when we saw the struggles that Dublin were having with Kildare, she said Dublin should be able to go out there in high heels and beat Kildare with the experience they have. <laughs> You would, have, you, you would have expected them to. Um, fair play to Kildare. Ben McCormick was outstanding for them. They, you never Until he started hitting ridiculous shots late on and dropping them to the keeper, hitting them wide, shots he should not have been taking on. It's amazing when the game goes into a melting pot how what you were doing for the previous 65 minutes can go out the window when you get it's not it's not white line fever it's it's this thing of we have to get over the line we have to get a shot um Paul Cribben did something similar dropped one short I think near the end just taking a lower percentage shot when throughout the game they took the higher percentage shot generally they totally packed their defense but they weren't passive like they were last year they were all like lads were sprinting into tackles lads were sprinting into space lads Dublin got very very few goal opportunities and obviously one of the big things here was Stephen Cluck and played starting the championship game. Um, I, I, he'd obviously been performing well in training, but if you're David O'Hannon, you're probably wondering what you've done wrong. But saying that, when you look at you know who Dublin have brought back this year, it's with the goal of winning All Ireland. And I, I always thought when Cluxton came back that he wasn't coming back to make up the numbers. He was coming back to start in a Dublin team that they hoped would win an All Ireland. Um, Would you leave the panel if you were if you were a sub goalkeeper and you see him just parachuted in? Uh, I wouldn't. No, I I I think you'd you'd probably realise what you could learn from him, maybe potentially as well. And plus, he obviously played the league final after him coming back in. He played uh, the Leinster quarter final. It's amazing to think like that. You know, O'Hanlon played the previous week against Mead. Like, was the concession of two goals enough? We kind of joked in the press room and told him more that Dublin, I, I just said when Dublin conceded the goals, even though they scored 430, that they wouldn't like that or whatever. And someone just passed the comment that, oh, geez, it might be a chance for Stephen Cluxton to get, to get back in. Not thinking that it actually would be. But I suppose, listen, if Desi Farrell thinks he's the better goalie within the squad, like, what would you do as manager? Would you have him in and get match practice? Now he's played a semi-final, he's going to be playing a final. And he'd be ready for all those all learning games. And he was, listen, he was safe as houses yesterday, as he always is. Yeah, a uh, reminder, we're brought to you by orgoretro.com. Use the promo code OURGAME and you'll get 15% off. There's a brilliant range of jerseys and zip-up tops, the whole lot there, whether it's uh, really old school or just the more recent retro stuff you're covered there. Also, we've got the live GA Club fundraisers here in our game. We did a brilliant one in Rowan Moore just a couple of weeks ago. So email us at events at ourgame.ie if you'd like us to run um, a club fundraiser for you. Um, one thing I want to talk about, though, like we, we know the results from the weekend. Derry and Armad are going to be in the uh, Ulster final. It's going to be Louth against Dublin in the Leinster final. 
But just to look at the seedings going into Talchon Cup and the Sam Maguire Cup, I think this is very interesting. So if you look at the, the first seeds in the Sam Maguire Cup, it could actually end... Look, we all know that Galway are massive favourites in this game. But you could be looking at Sligo as a top seed. And you could actually be looking at a Sligo as a... Well, obviously, you're more likely to have him as a second seed. But the likes of Sligo, Clare and Louth, who would all be fancied to lose their provincial finals, they're all going to be second seeds here, which actually lowers the chances of a massive group of death, really, doesn't it? Because yeah. let's call a spade a spade. There are third seeds here, and I'll bring it back up on the screen again. Mayo, Ross, Common, Toronto, Monaghan would be fanished, uh, would be fancy to beat every one of them. What's the worst possible group to get there? Um, Cork, Cork, Galway. I'm just, sorry, I'm, I'm I'm looking from the fourth seed. Just think of a Cork, Mayo, De, uh, Cork, Mayo, Armagh. Kerry. No, Cork, Mayo, Dublin, Kerry. I mean, it's not, we expect Louth to lose that game, but like, it still is possible. Yeah, you're talking more likely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. more likely scenarios. Yeah, there yeah, probably yeah. isn't, like, I have to say, um, I don't think there's any need for this. Uh, I think there should only be eight teams coming out of the All Ireland stage. I think it's bonkers that the third team is, gets to play a playoff game or whatever. I think that's, and it's an excess week that we're bringing in. I think if you're going to this All Ireland stage, it's, only two can come out with this each group and they go straight to quarterfinals. I think three and four should be gone, to be honest. Yeah, I, don't I, agree. Think, I don't think you should be allowing a trap door for teams to get back in. Yeah, it's too much. Like, it, there's real jeopardy when you know that two are gone. It's a bit like Munster and, and Leinster to a lesser degree in, in the hurling. You do, well, there's need... no jeopardy in Munster, nobody can be relegated from Munster. Uh, yeah, but coming out. Okay, but no, is that a bit mad as well? Like, I saw somebody on Twitter, I think maybe Kevin Egan, saying that you know, the fact that they're. You know, Munster is that holier than thou that you can't even get relegated from it. Yeah, and rightly so. But I'd actually, <laughs> I'd actually like Kerry, or even if Kerry didn't want to go in, I'd like a six team in Munster anyway, just to balance it out so that teams are playing the same amount of games and have the same amount of breaks or not breaks. There's no whatever. excuses in scheduling or whatever, yeah. Just quickly, yeah, I, want, I just want to talk about Glenn Ryan's comments about Dublin because this this was fairly pointed after. Um, he just said, he's talking about Dublin playing in Crow Park and he's talking about the officiating as well. He just said, but then there's a familiarity that Dublin have with here that no other county gets a chance of it, and that and it does benefit them. I'm probably echoing the thoughts of most other counties. Then the sideline, it's always our players who are told to put the gum shield in by a fourth official or a fifth official. It's always the fourth official telling our sideline to maybe take a step back a bit when a mentor from the Dublin team is actually standing in ours. And then you see a sideline ball uh, that's nowhere near a sideline ball, and it's given against you. Ryan added in reference to a controversial call against uh, Daniel Flynn. It was one incident in the game that swung it, and I thought the referee, Fergal Kelly, did a very good job of it. You can talk about sour grapes if you like, but it's a familiarity. There's that's It's a familiarity that's certainly not Dublin's fault. It's frustrating. All of these calls seem to come at the big moments when it's going into the deciding stages of the game. Fergal Kelly, I thought, did a great job, but in general, from the side and from officials, you just always feel that you're getting treated second rate. Um, very, very interesting comments, I have to say. Well, I'd like if other managers who do believe that that is the case would also man up and say it. Because it is an advantage to Dublin. There's no doubt about it. I'm not saying that the officials are swayed or anything like that. But it is their, their home ground. And if other managers do feel this way, would they not just say, OK, do you know what? People will say you're weak or you're afraid or whatever of coming up against Dublin. Like you need to say it. If you're it isn't the truth, topic. you're telling what you see is the truth, and what a lot of people see is the truth. There's a really good clip going around of <laughs> Anthony Rainbow telling Darren Daly pre in pretty choice words to get the whatever out, out of our area or whatever yesterday. But like I, I, you know, it's the way Glenn is talking. There is you've played and been involved with teams where you're going to a Lions then you're going to the opposition venue and not been smart. I've managed teams off uh, borough teams in St. Brendan's park where you're playing in your home ground. Of course, you're going to use every advantage that you can. And if it's a home game, then you do, but there's no way Dublin should be getting any advantages from playing a Leinster semi-final at a venue, at a Leinster venue. Do you know what I mean? There's no way there should be any advantages for them. But the way it is, there are always there seems to be. And it also just ruins the spectacle as well, having a, having these games at Croke Park when they should be at a smaller venue, at a, a 30,000 type venue. I mean, even I know Nolan Park is more noted for Hurling, but imagine what it would be like packed with 27,000 people down there. Oh, yeah, but you're... Um, 
when the Dubs played Leach down there, that was one of the great occasions in the mm. Leinster Football Championship when they went on the road. So there's there's no reason why not. Um, I just think those sort of games are lost in Crow Park. Now, I would say on Kildare, lastly, um, in fairness to them, they kind of, they righted a fair amount of wrongs from last year. And the question with Kildare now is, after an atrocious league, when they still managed to save their stats, can they build on that going into the All-Ireland stages? Can they get into the, an All-Ireland quarter-final? And that'll be the thing. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I suppose the way it's worked out, it's great for them to have the, the Sam Maguire competition to still face into, but they've just been so disappointing in recent times. And um, But, like, where are Dublin at? Because this was very unconvincing stuff. What, was it five goals they scored against Kildare last year? Obviously, Kildare were, were desperate from the get-go. But, like, Paul Mannion, he scored three. He was taken off with cramp. Uh, Conor Callahan and Cormac Costello, they scored a couple each as well. Ross McGarry. Shane, Mick O'Grady must be one of the most underrated players. Mick O'Grady did a great job on Con again, and he tends to do a really good job on whoever he's marking and any of the elite forwards. Sorry for cutting across here. Yeah, yeah. But like, it was an interesting point you made before. Did you say it was something like 10 or 11 scorers from, from Dublin? But they yeah. managed just fourteen points. Yeah, like that's like it's just a, oh, with eleven scores, you can say it, like you can take you can take that whatever way you want, but they kick fourteen points in a championship mm. game. Like I can't since they were beaten by uh, Mead with the five goals in twenty ten. I can't remember a game in any way this tight. I think Mead brought them down with stretch in the game a couple of years ago, but two points is fairly not not very flattering. And maybe now to look at it as an opportunity going into that Leinster final. It gives us some sort of a hope of having a competitive, and, and I'd imagine Loud will travel big time for this game. 13 years on from the time that they were unlucky, will we put it that way? But uh, starting Cluxon, that was <laughs> yeah, Cluxon's unlucky, 110. Yeah. yeah. Cluxon's 110 championship appearance, his first time uh, playing since the 2020 All Ireland final when he captained them to the six in a row. They haven't won an All Ireland since. Desi Farrell afterwards says, I thought he played well. Obviously, we've had challenge matches with goalkeepers in ter- or challenges with goalkeepers in terms of injuries over the last month. Evan Comfort is still working his way back to fitness. David O'Hanlon had a very good league. Very happy with him in against the um, against Leach in the opener as well. We just felt it was time to try Stephen and give him some exposure and game time. If anything happened to David, you could be in trouble. So now is a good time to do it. Uh, look, Spain, that, that's an interesting way of looking at uh, it now, but that's not reality. That is no, not reality. He is they're basically saying that they were giving Stephen Cluxon some game time in the Leinster semi final in case David O'Hanlon got injured. That, that's not realistic. I'd be amazed if he doesn't play every game from here on in. Yeah, so loud 27 points, awfully 215 after extra time. It seems like it was just that little bridge too far. I don't know, maybe playing in different divisions. I'm, I'm not entirely sure, but this had to be a tough one from your point of view. No bridge too far here, Shane. We should have we should have won we should have won the game at the end of normal time. Um, it looked like now we we're going to kick on the third quarter. Um, and they did kick on. They were three or four up, but we got back level. Anton Sullivan kicked the level and point in injury time, and we just had a couple of chances. And just before that, Jack Bryan had a brilliant mark, and he kicked it wide. Probably didn't. I don't I forget what the allocated time is to take a mark. Is it? I don't 15 know. Fifteen seconds, isn't it? Like he definitely didn't take the fifteen. He rushed it a bit. And I think it was was a keen Farrell then had a chance. We were running the ball at the end, and we looked like to have a man over, and we just we took a shot from forty yards, and we probably could have got it into around twenty five yards. And do you know when you know your chance is gone going into extra time? It just for all the world, it looked like our chance was gone, and Loud totally kicked on in that in that first uh, the first period of extra time, and we're deserving winners. Listen, they were probably the better team overall, but that's not to say that we didn't have chances to win it, and we probably should have won it normal time. Disappointingly, but like when we played the Talchin Cup semi final in Crow Park last year, with more experienced players on board than we have now, we were you know blown out of water. This is a you know we have stepped up big time. Um, I don't know. They've obviously, uh, you know, it, it sounds mad to say it, but Liam Kearns' is passing has bonded this squad even more. They're so tight. I know chatting the guys, they're so tight. It's been such an emotional season. Um, just disappointing that they couldn't get that result, but still a really, really good performance. A heartwarming performance, I have to say. Yeah, and like in terms of Louth, Sam Mulroy, Kieran Downey, they did some of the, the main scoring there. How do you think that performance sets them up for the Leinster final against Dublin? Uh, well they got a good test anyway I'll put it to you that way no more than Dublin did off Kildare um, 
any notions of them being, you know, clear front runner for second in Leinster is probably kind of blown out of the water, maybe as well. But they go in probably with, like, they'll have expectations themselves, but they would have been expecting to probably to beat awfully by, by three or four, I would say, in normal time. So, and it's another game for Sam Mulroy. He played near, I think he played, I think he played all, the, all of extra time. I missed the last couple of minutes. Um, he should be better again going into the Leinster final. Kieran Downey kicked seven from play, but like, Savage stuff. Uh, Conor Grimes good as well. Um, I think they'll find like they'll, they'll slightly fancy the chances of an upset. They're obviously really competitive with Dublin in that Division Two League final that was in Crow Park earlier this year as well. Um, so they've played in Crow Park. This will be their third time to play in Crow Park this year. So and they played there in the Division Four final a couple of years ago, I think, and uh, Division Three final last year. Um, they'll be quietly confident. I, I can't see them winning it, but there'll be there'll be some optimism going in definitely. Yeah, so we know that the Ulster final is going to be Armagh against uh, Derry. So Derry were very good against Mana, and if one twenty one to two ten, I was watching it the other day, and as like Shane McGuigan seems to go from strength to strength, he's just so elusive, so good on the ball, brilliant kicker. He's up there with the top forwards in the country now, and I don't know is he all that far away from the top echelon where Shane Walsh and uh, David Clifford are. I don't think he's that far off that level at all. Would you agree? No, nah, he's a brilliant player. Yeah, brilliant player. He's outstanding from the, cl- the highlights of Saudi Arabia. Is, is he up? What is he up at the elite? No, he's not. A, no, I'm saying he's not far. He's not far off it. But yeah, it's not, it's, not, it's not a bad bracket to be in either, though, is it? And you don't get loaded with as many bullets playing for Derry as you do for Kerry and Galway. Very true. Can I just say, lastly, on Dublin as well, Dublin left Kildare in that game the other day. There's a lot of things, and it goes into Gerardo Gracon's point there. He just said this Cluxton sideshow is part of Dublin's drop in form, whether it's the training during COVID, poaching on O'Donnell, etc. Desi Farrell can't resist causing a sideshow. They're definitely not as clinical as they left Kildare in with a chance of lobbing a ball in for a haymaker at the end, and that's not like them. Back to McGuigan, um, he's kind of the, he's their marquee man up front. Um, you would be looking at from an opposition point of view if we can keep him under wraps somewhat. Are we keeping Derry under wraps somewhat? But this is probably their best best championship performance in a while. Like Monaghan are a difficult, difficult proposition, and had obviously beaten Tyrone in a championship game two weeks ago. But Derry blew them out of the water. It'd be fair to say, and McGuigan's four from play were crucial in that. Mm, and obviously it goes without saying that Conor Callahan is in that top bracket as well. Geez, I get shot out in Kula if I didn't uh, I didn't include him in that bracket. Um, so Carl O'Connell he scored one one for Monaghan. Carl Gallagher he scored a goal as well. Like I thought it was very interesting listening to Michael Murphy do co commentary throughout the game because he was pointed out how Derry were continuously continually um, going for Conor McManus and Jack McCarron. When they were back defending, they were trying to find ways to isolate them and then they'd go really, they'd go at them. Conor McCluskey, he was brilliant. Conor Glass. Yeah, class player, isn't he? Yeah. Conor Glass's point at the very start of the game, it just kind of set the tone. It must have been 40 yards out and he blasted it over. Now, another thing that really stood out to me, and I'd love to know if the viewers agree with this as well, was that last year, Derry, they were afraid to take shots from 30, 35 yards out against Galway in the All-Ireland semi-final. And they wouldn't drop it in on top of the goalie either. Obviously, the Galway goalkeeper had been struggling. But in this game, it's it, they were very good at long-range shooting. Not always 100% or anything like that. But they were more willing to take on the long-range shooting because they know, ultimately, when you get to Croke Park or when you play against the big teams on the big days, you're going to be able to have to shoot from distance. And they seem to have added that to their arsenal. Yeah, they need to have that strength to their bow realistically. All the other top teams have it that they can put over points from 45 yards out if there's a congested defence or, you know, they're tying down the likes of Shane McGuigan or whoever. You need to be able to do that. They just, like, they scored 1-6 in an all in semi-final last mm. year. You know, that's the, the nuts and bolts of it. They're going to have to be able to put bigger tallies when push comes to shove. But they're kind of going from strength to strength now, having it looked like maybe their frailties were exposed against Dublin in that Division 2 final. That was one of their best. That's probably one of their best performances under Gallagher the other night. Yeah, and it's the first time since 1971 that they've won five Ulster Championship matches in a row. First time going back to back finals in Ulster since 1998, and they haven't, you know, collected back to back titles since 1976. So it all feels very positive for them. At Just the on that, Shane, as well. Like you have people, you have people giving out about maybe the way they play sometimes, and oh, they, ha- they you know. They don't maybe don't have a great squad depth or they're over reliant on whoever. But when you think of the base that Rory Gallagher took them over from and where he has gotten them to now, it's quite phenomenal, really. Like it really is. And you can give out about 
X and Y and that they play this way and you know there might be tactical fouling and different things but the base that he's taken them from to where they are now to been potentially going for back to back Ulster titles so it's like it's it's a crazy crazy step up yeah and Rory Gallagher was talking about Oren Lynch's role as the goalkeeper and like he was very advanced that he goes he's a phenomenally talented individual who has uh, has to stay very focused very driven that's my responsibility me and all the rest of the management but I believe he's just a great talent he has an innate ability to play football at a high level the occasion does not get to him within that there are mistakes but I believe what I ask him is very difficult to perform and he does it we keep driving it the standard of football and standard of top teams is going up Oran is part of that then um, the other semi-final, Armagh put down to the sword 4-12 to, or sorry, 4-10 to 12 points. And they're back in an Ulster final for the first time since 2008, which is kind of hard to credit. Obviously, they went to a replay with Fermanagh that year. That means Down are going to go into the Talchon Cup. It feels like Down are a bit better than the Talchon Cup team, but I mean, you are where you are, even though that's to some degree a product of what's happened in previous years, not just necessarily this year under Conor Laverty because of the league seedings. But Andrew Murnham, he scored 1-1. Uh, Kieran Mack and Shane McParland and Rean O'Neill, they all scored a goal each. Jason Duffy, he scored two points, and there was plenty of other lads who added a point each. Pat uh, Haveron scored six points, and Ryan McAvoy scored two for down. But uh, another very good performance from Armagh. They're back into an Ulster final. And I think this is a fairly tasty sound in Ulster final. Yeah, no, it definitely is. Um, it definitely is. And I you know the selector slash coach, Kieran McKeever, have been saying that the All Ireland the All Ireland Senior Football Championship or the you know the group stages was all that they had their eyes on, but I don't uh, I don't buy that one bit. Um and they're really they were really good any balls that went in around the square as well. They got two goals in each half, obviously. Um uh, and that's gonna be yeah, it's gonna be a tasty Ulster final. From a down point of view, um you could say that they might be what they will be one of the stronger teams in the Talchon Cup and maybe they'll be better served in the All Ireland Championship. But I think it's probably perfect for them in the Talchon Cup. They could potentially go on a run uh, potentially get to you know play a semi final, maybe a final in Crow Park, maybe get some potential silverware as well. So like in in Conor Laverty's first year, I'd say it's not a bad scenario to be going into the Talchon Cup. So uh, Trump Spieler says Derry are setting Gaelic football back a decade. So contrived, no flair, so systematic. Galway Mayo Kerry play with spontaneity. Hopefully they show Derry up, or everyone else will start copying Derry. I'd be interested to know if other people believe that. Richard Hogan from Division Four versus Watford. I think it was Wexford actually to All Ireland candidates. Serious journey from Derry. Brian O'Malley says the Munster Council need to look at the uh, at order of round four in Munster. The fixtures need to be flipped. Totally unfair to have Clare play all four games before Limerick and Tipperary have played just two. Okay, so um, is there anything else before we finish off? I think Go of the week. <laughs> Go, Go of the week. week. <laughs> God almighty, as ever, we're dreadfully unprepared for our goal of the week. Who are you going to give it to? Um, I can uh, John Conlon's the only man, really. Um, I'd say I wonder, I wonder how much did he celebrate at that wedding after? And I'd say he was carried shoulder high. You know, and lads would get a few pints into them. I'm sure he wouldn't like to have been, but I'd say lads were, uh, yeah, were uh, fairly complimentary towards him. I'd say. Yeah, I I find it hard not to put Dara Fitzgibbon in the conversation as well, considering how long he's been out, and like those two young lads for Galway, Liam Collins and Declan McLaughlin. You know, Brian Kilcannon. We barely mentioned Brian Kilcannon. Sure, sure do you want to? Do you want to just give it to everybody? So the uh, the flock. <laughs> what what's the collective down for goats? That's a good question. I don't know. Uh, a, a child goat is called a kid anyway, but I don't know what a collective is. A it's herd? a flock. It's flock. a flock. It's a flock of goats. Doesn't sound right, does it? No, 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 no. Remember Johnny Pilkington said when Bab said about awfully been a sheep in the head heap, they were not a bad old flock after all. So, so the collective known <laughs> is a heap. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, yeah. Right, and then in football, um, will I give it to, I'll probably go and give it to Kieran Downey for scoring seven points for now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm not going to give it to someone that, that broke my heart to be honest. To be honest with you, I'll give it to uh, I give it to Andrew Murden who ended up at one one for our match. Okay, so let us know who you th- who the goats of the week are as far as you're concerned. Own Cody was good. John Conlon says Jack. Uh, plenty of pos- plenty for down to be positive about following where they have come from. Uh, says Richard Hogan as well. We nearly have it all said, have we? All said, Chen. All said. Yeah, we back on Thursday. It's wham bam. Thank you, ma'am. Isn't it? We love yeah, it's all good. It's hard to know what happened in different matches. We're having to go back over and over. Like, was that that match? Was that this week? But anyway, there's loads happening. If you want to get the audio podcast, go to patreon.com forward slash our game. And a reminder, we're brought to you by orgoretro.com. Absolutely brilliant sponsors over the last number of years. Use the promo code our game to get 15% off. Michael, we'll get you again. <laughs>